I know what you may be asking yourself. Who in their right mind would go to such lengths to talk about a video game from 1998 that only a handful of people ever played? And it's a good question, but as it happens, I'm not in my right mind, so I don't have to entertain it. And quite frankly, no one else on YouTube has really bothered to talk about Red Guard for longer than 15 minutes. I'm not discrediting those other videos, they're probably more well put together than this one's gonna turn out. They give you the gist so you can move on quickly and go about your day. But we both know that time is just an artificial construct, and if there's one thing YouTube needs more of, it's multi-hour Elder Scrolls retrospectives. And I am more than happy to contribute. So why this game? Well, honestly, Redguard is just fascinating. What? Both for a long-time Elder Scrolls enjoyer and someone who enjoys playing shitty games for fun, which is all I was expecting this game to be. Redguard is more than just a shitty game, though. I love this game, but for everything I love about it, there's something else that I absolutely despise. Redguard is lucky that it has the words Elder Scrolls in its title, otherwise I doubt it would even be remembered by anyone 25 years in the future. I certainly wouldn't have part with it, that's for sure. If you want to hear about every little thing that this antique has to offer, the good, the bad, and the downright broken, then just sit back, strap in. What do you mean pirate ships don't have seatbelts? Well, you better just hold on to something and hope that the boat doesn't capsize. God help you if you suffer from seasickness. To fully understand the development of this grand swashbuckling adventure, we need context. So let's have a brief look at the studio that was responsible for just whatever the hell this turned out to be. Well met, stranger! Magnificent! This is Bethesda Softworks. The year is 1996. Daggerfall had just hit shelves and was already doing numbers. Gamers praised the role-playing game for its attention to life sim details, truly allowing players to immerse themselves in a rich open world. They could be anyone, do anything. This is the motto that would become synonymous with Bethesda's open world RPGs. Daggerfall had a planned expansion which ended up becoming its own standalone game, Battlespire, releasing in 1997. Instead of an open world, Battlespire took a linear approach, the whole game essentially being one big dungeon crawl. It was a departure from their fantasy life sim games, but it was made with a specific audience in mind. Bethesda's most radical departure for the series was being developed alongside Battlespire. That departure eventually dropped in 1998 with The Elder Scrolls Adventures of Redguard. Notable for being an action-adventure game as opposed to an RPG, inspired by popular games in the genre, such as Tomb Raider and Prince of Persia, there aren't many similarities that can be drawn between Redguard and its predecessors. In fact, Redguard has none of the RPG elements that fans of the series would be familiar with at this point. What do you mean I can't play as my OC Breton monk, Mr. Fister? Why do I have to play as this chap? Because Todd said so. This is Todd Howard, but you already know who this guy is, and he knows who you are. He knows what you look like. He knows where you live. In fact, he's right outside your door. Did you buy the anniversary edition? I hope you're still subscribed to Fallout first. Oh god, please, Todd, no! He got his first job at Bethesda working on their Terminator franchise, as well as working on CD ports for Arena and Daggerfall. We know him now as Todd the Liar, who overpromises and underdelivers. These NPCs are not scripted. Things didn't start out that way though, his first ever shot in the big seat would be with Redguard. Yep, this game is mostly Todd's baby. Alongside Kurt Coleman and Michael Kirkbride, the trio are credited as the lead designers and writers for the game. According to Coleman, the entire game, including the puzzles and story, were written in just under a week. And it shows. This game was supposed to be Bethesda's big ticket into the mainstream. No longer would they be just a fledgling studio designing computer games for a niche audience. This time they were aiming for the big leagues, at least based on how much they talk this game up during pre-release interviews. And critical miss. 
Red Guard's flop was basically responsible for the company almost going bankrupt in the 90s. If not for the formation of Zenimax, then it's possible that Bethesda would have fizzled out before they got a chance to release what is arguably their magnum opus, Morrowind. The less than anticipated sales of Battlespire did the company no favours either. Redguard shipped with about 150,000 units. That's not how many copies of the game they sold, just how many they produced for that initial release date. Guess how many they actually sold. Keep guessing because I couldn't find any numbers online, as hard as I tried. But for reference, they expected this game to sell hotter than Daggerfall, which sold 120,000 copies just in the tail end of 1996. A respectable number, especially in the niche market of computer RPGs. Red Guard wasn't just meant to be some one-and-done spin-off either. More Elder Scrolls Adventures titles were planned, but ended up being gutted after the aforementioned financial car crash. I've just told you about all the hot water this game put Bethesda in, and that may have coloured your perception about the quality of the released product. But what did reviewers have to think? You'd be surprised to hear that reviewers in 98 ate this game up. With fairly great review scores being thrown around by almost every publication that covered this game. So why did Redguard fail? I think Todd himself says it best in this interview with Lex Friedman. I think it's one of the last, like, DOS games in a Windows world. So it, I think it missed kind of a technology window as well as ultimately not what people wanted from us. Like it would have had a much better home on say PlayStation or Xbox. I would like to apologize. I've made a severe and continuous lapse in my judgment. Why? because I'm going to exposit at you. Not much more than I already have done when talking about Bethesda. This time, the exposition dump is for the story itself. So class, please take your seats, because I'm about to school y'all in some of the finer points of this game's lore. Well, to be honest, it's all just points that come up in the intro cutscene, but shut up and pay attention. The story of the Elder Scrolls Adventures Redguard takes place towards the end of the second era, making it the earliest canon game in the series, yeah, I just said ESO isn't canon. Big whoop, wanna fight about it? To put that into perspective, Arena, Daggerfall, Morrowind, and Oblivion all take place about 400 years or so after this game. Skyrim takes place 200 years after those games, all the way in the fourth era. The events of this game are actually closer to ESO than they are Tez 1. But didn't you just say that the Elder Scrolls Online wasn't shut up? Cyber Septim, who is kind of a big deal in these games, is well into his conquest of Tamriel, aiming to unite the continent under the flag of his new empire. Only a few kingdoms yet remain unclaimed by the Cyrodiilic superpower, until recently, Hammerfell included. Oh yeah, the game about the Red Guards takes place at Hammerfell, if you've played one of these games and you've probably guessed that already. <coughs> The Red Guards are putting up a good fight, showing the mongrel dogs of the Empire who's boss. Then the King of Hammerfell, Fassad II, just fucking dies one day and the whole nation goes into DEFCON 3. The King's death sparks a civil war between the two factions in Hammerfell's court, the Crowns and the Forebears. The Crowns are all about independence and ain't about to let the new kid on the block walk all over them. Especially not with the treaty they propose, which doesn't put Hammerfell in a great position. The forebears were already a little more imperialized than the crowns, even before all the beef, and they are actually all down for the occupation of Tiber Septum. The forebears are losing this slapping competition, however. Eventually, the whole thing turns into a case of my dad could batter your dad when the forebears call in the aid of Sugar Daddy Septim, who immediately begins sending troops into Hammerfell to fight the crowns. The crowns, of course, have their own daddy in the form of the prince. Prince Ator is the leader of the crowns and son to the late Facade. He, alongside his most loyal crowns, put on one final stand on the Isle of Stroh's Mackay. It's here where this little sweet roll waddles into our story. This is Lord Richton, Tiber Septim's greatest and most diabetic commander. His forces meet the forces of Prince Ator at Stroh's Mackay, and for a while it's a pretty fair match until the Empire reveal one final ace they had hidden in their boot. The last power move comes in the form of none other than a dragon, Nephilolagus, 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 my name is Nephilolagus, who attacks the crowns under Richton's command. 
The prince channels his inner Sigma grind set to charge the dragon head on, but before he can strike, he is pierced by a poison arrow let loose by Richton's finest stealth archer. The archmage Voa tries to save the prince, but he gets slain by the dragon, and the best he can do is catch the prince's soul inside a gem. Yeah, have a nice vacation to the soul Khan, buddy. And no, not even that soul Khan. The battle spire soul Khan. <laughs> Having defeated the crown, Septim sends his men into the rest of the kingdom, stationing troops in all of the cities of Hammerfell. Septim also grants Richton the honour of serving as Stroh's Mackay's new governor. I know I just threw a lot of names at you, but don't worry, I will refresh your minds as they become relevant, but it doesn't hurt to have a little context. Class dismissed. This is all well and good, but it only introduces the world this game takes place in. Next, let's introduce the main protagonist of Redguard. Cyrus is our boy, he is the Redguard in question. His role in this story begins here, not in Hammerfell, but in Wayrest. In fact, despite being born in the region, Cyrus hasn't actually returned to Hammerfell for many years. He has instead took up the life of a mercenary, lending his soul to the highest bidder. There is more to Cyrus's backstory that you can read in the official comic that released with Redguard, The Origin of Cyrus, written by Michael Kirkbride. I'll link it down in the description, it's an interesting read and has some art that I'm sure the Morrowind fans will get a kick out of. Other than that, it just expands on a few story details, such as how Cyrus and his BFF Tobias first became acquainted. A bit of insight into Cyrus's youth, it also elaborates on what went down when Cyrus killed his sisters- oops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Bitter is the cold, but courteous is the flame whose dim shadows trace figures along the rustic cobbles of the tavern interior. Shadows of merchants and commoners who drift indoors along the chilling breeze. Shadows of drunkards and scoundrels who seem too frostbitten to keep up their usual rabble. Two figures stand out in the centre of the room, one heavy, grave of intention, one slicked back, fuzzy with a tail. Cyrus's business in Wayrest involves meeting with the resident fixer, Serafra. The two have history, but we're not here to talk about history, no. Cyrus thinks he's here on mercenary biz, but is surprised when the furry instead presents him a letter. Sliding the folded note out of the already broken seal, Cyrus is taken back when he reads about the disappearance of his sister. Azara. The Red Guard explains that there was some nasty business about 10 years ago and hasn't spoken to Azara since. What kind of nastiness? We haven't spoken in 10 years. There was trouble. I killed her husband. Yeah, he's, he's that blunt about it. He decides to ditch whatever the hell he was doing before and charters a ship headed to the island city of Stroh's Mackay. He promises Captain Brennan here double the usual price for the promise that they'll get there with haste, regardless of the storm currently plaguing the Iliac. Once in all Stroh's Mackay, Cyrus will meet with whoever wrote the letter and begins searching for his missing sister. Because, of course, this is a Todd Howard game, so the plot has to involve the disappearance of a family member. Yep, even in 1998 Bethesda had that whole shtick. Red Guy gets a pass though, because it is the first time that this happens. I'm genuinely concerned that Bethesda might only be capable of writing two types of story though, the other being the prophesied doomsday event. At least Daggerfall had some innovation with its storytelling, but that was a direct response to the criticism of the plot of Arena being shallow. I just wish that the Bethesda of today had the same drive to defy expectations instead of giving up completely and leaning into the meme. And finally, with all that story dumping out of the way, we can now talk about the reason you're actually here. The game underneath the wiki's worth of lore. I would say that Redguard is equal parts action and story, if you count the puzzles and investigations as uptime along with the combat. Downtime is then the time you spend walking between locations and reading through quest guides. I will be talking about everything this game has to offer at length throughout this analysis, as well as whatever else I think is relevant, and sometimes whatever isn't relevant. But this is my video and I get to bullshit about whatever I want, as long as I have the willpower to write, voice and edit that together. 
Cyrus is aboard his cruise, now just outside of the Hunding Bay, inside which rests the city of Stroh's Mackay. Two pirates sneak aboard the vessel, somehow managing to avoid all the sharks and hentai monsters infesting the waters. Get below is what the pilot said to the wet yet needs before him. The Restless League is claiming this cargo, said the other with cruel, cruel clarity. Probably wouldn't make a difference if I told you I had no time for this. They threaten Cyrus and the crew to hit the deck or else pirate things will happen. One of the fellows mentions that they're part of a group called the Restless League, which is a name one would do well to remember. Sure enough, this is a pirate game and pirate things do indeed happen, so Cyrus engages in a pirate duel with the two. Yes, a doubtful notion it is, piracy and politics, but there you have it. Never been much for politics in my day, piracy was honest work. Don't be a hero, boy. Where's the money in that? Which brings me to my first major grievance. There is no form of tutorial, which is odd here because you would have thought an isolated instance such as a ship in the middle of the ocean would be a perfect place to introduce the mechanics of the game. At very least, the combat, which is what the player is immediately thrown into here. I accredit a lot of my problems in this game to an overall lack of explanation. I can only assume that the physical guide that came with copies of the game also serves as a surrogate tutorial. Unfortunately, the page for the guide on the wiki is incomplete. I couldn't find it transcribed anywhere online and wasn't about to spend ridiculous amounts of money on eBay, so I was left with a few head scratches. The first of which here resulted in me running around like a headless goose, until I had to look in the menu to find the attack button and proceeded to spam the hell out of it, until the gentleman who stood before me fell down. This pantomime you are seeing on screen right now is what Bethesda in 1998 would call combat and get used to seeing it because it doesn't ever change throughout this entire story. You can shimmy and you can strike, and that's about it. The complaints Morrowind receives about its combat system often stem from a lack of understanding of that game's RPG mechanics and what it was going for. My complaints of Redguard's combat system stem from a lack of understanding of common sense from the designers. Since this is an action game, not an RPG, and should provide adequate feedback based on what's happening on screen. We'll take a detailed look at the combat system of Red Guard and how it doesn't work in its own section. The captain of the men who just got slapped around is a mean looking bold dude. Since he's on another ship, he can do nothing except shake his fist in frivolous malice towards us, because I guess his ship doesn't have cannons. The extent of gunpowder knowledge is somewhat debatable across Tamriel and across canon lore editions. Get it? Cannon. 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 Just know that even here, in the most swashbuckling of adventures, it's still unclear whether the implication of gunpowder is an oversight or not. The moments following the encounter offer just enough time for one to catch their breath. Then, like a trunk overladen with gold, the gilded shores of Stroh's Mackay trickle over the horizon. This is where we'll take our first steps into this handcrafted open world. Experience. This is Stroh's Mackay. More specifically, Port Hunding, but I think that name being given to the city might be an addition of ESO. I can't remember anyone in Redguard referring to the town by that name. And what a bustling town it is, truly, with almost as many figures walking the docks as there are polygons on screen. The reason for the town's population problem is obviously a limitation of the game's development, but you can interpret that after the battle, subsequent occupation by the Imperials, and sacking of the town, no one wants to live here anymore. Half the people walking around town will refuse to even speak with Cyrus due to Imperial suspicion. It's not exactly what I'd call a shithole though, and trust me, I've seen my fair share of shitholes. I do live in the United Kingdom and have been outside before. Shocking. The town still looks relatively well put together even during Richton's reign of terror. Port Hunding's two main attractions... Uh, should, I just, should I just call it Stroh's Mackay? I'm just going to call it Stroh's Mackay. PSO. Stroh's Mackay's two main attractions are the harbour and the palace. At a stretch, you could say that the Mages Guild and Observatory are also important aspects of the city, but 
there's a major's guild in every city, and the observatory is on the other side of the bay, pretty much in complete wilderness. Alongside the residences, some other notable locations include a few shops, a pub, some warehouses, a park, and even a colossus of Frandar Hunding that watches over the bay. Not much about this town in this game even hints towards the bustling ship haven it's supposed to be. This is an issue of scale, but Redguard was doing its best with the technology Bethesda had in 19. I'd say they did pretty well, considering this is Bethesda's first handcrafted world. The elevation differences make a nice change from Arena and Daggerfall's flat procedurally generated towns. The city is almost similar to Whiterun in how it's laid out in tiers, but there isn't a clear focus as to what kind of service goes into which district. The next closest comparison I can make then is to Anvil, which is also a harbour town with a large Red Guard population. What Stroh's Mackay lacks is a consistent aesthetic. The tiled roofs and stone white buildings are what give Anvil its strong Mediterranean seaside flavour. The palace is really the only location in town that feels like it has its own character, especially inside with its large, brightly tiled rooms. Some of the other buildings around town do look the part, whereas others look like they could have belonged anywhere. Vardenfell had some similar architecture and locations that were recently colonised by the Empire, such as in Sedanin and Caldera. It is possible then that the buildings here could have similarly been built by the Imperials. It has only been three months since the battle however, and I can't imagine many contractors would be willing to venture all the way out here. Not during the aftermath of a civil war, and in the middle of a foreign takeover at least. But to be fair, I am looking way too much into this for the sake of a tangent about aesthetics in a 1998 DOS game, and I doubt aesthetics were a high priority during production. In fact, I'm not sure anything was prioritised above making sure this game could run on the X engine. Cyrus once again pops out the letter given to him by Sarafra. Tobias is supposed to be meeting him at an establishment called the Dragon Tail Inn. Oh, the Dragon Tail Inn, sorry. I mentioned Tobias earlier, he's an old friend of Cyrus who is now retired from mercenary work to live the life of a travelling merchant. First objective, find the inn. To do that, we need to talk to people. So let's see how the dialogue mechanics have been adapted into this fully voice acted game. It somewhat resembles how Oblivion would handle its dialogue, but the difference here is that both parties are voiced. Somehow the dialogue system in Redguard manages to be more functional than the one found in Fallout 4. At least here we can say more than just yes, no and maybe. Sorry, I mean A, B, Y and X, or square, triangle, circle, X. Hey, this game can even do multi-person conversations with less jank than Fallout 4. I'm sorry Fallout 4, I don't mean to be rude, Bethesda just really did you dirty on the dialogue department, didn't they? Here we get to ask about a list of topics that will expand as we progress further into the story. Some dialogue options even lead into sub-menus or conversations where you get a few more options. It's not fantastic, but it is functional and less cumbersome than Daggerfall. If they wanted to streamline this game for a general audience, there was no way they were keeping with that system of dialogue. Casual gamers, after all, cannot read. Read, nigga! Read! No! Battlespire had also managed to pull off full voice acting, but with varying results. <laughs> I feast upon your life, force mortal. Hot and juicy. Trembling, a gush of fluids, a split in skin and gone forever. What a glorious treat, manly. Oh yeah, the voice acting. Ow! Ow! Don't hurt me! We'll talk about that at some point too. For now, I just know that this game only had six credited voice actors. That includes the only two unique voice actors, those being the narrator in the intro cinematic and Cyrus himself. That means that the remaining 40 plus NPCs only had four voices to go around. Two male and 
two female voices, and I can almost count the number of female characters in this game on one hand. Stross Mackay's population problem also extends to the disparity between the sexes. Speaking of women, this is Siona, the first person on the island Cyrus ever talks to. He asks her for directions to the Dragon Tail Inn. She doesn't tell him where it is for whatever reason, but lets him know that the inn is run by an Argonian called Drikius, and it's mostly just forebears who frequent the joint to get pissed nowadays. The harbour is also home to this little sleazeball, slumped back behind a battered table. He greets Cyrus and gives him his name, Kotaro. He's sitting on a job that needs running and is looking for anyone who looks like they're able to handle it. It involves delivering an item into the palace and the possession of Richton himself. Cyrus says no thanks for now, but makes note of the offer in case he has need of coin. Kataro was at least a little more helpful than Siona when asked for directions. Cyrus bids the man farewell and continues up the ramp and into the sea, but not before accidentally rustling the chimneys of one of the guards by drawing his sword at an inappropriate time. Cyrus puts a quick end to this unnecessary use of lethal force using his own lethal force. Luckily, Redguard has no bounty system, so word of his deed does not travel. The Tavern, where none other than Tobias in all his swagger awaits. I bet you can't guess what race he belongs to. Cyrus! You made it! Come here, lad! How oh, you look good! It's been too long! If you hadn't retired... <laughs> Mercenary likes younger men's work! Bah, he said. <laughs> if you said Nord, you're only half right, because Tobias is only half Nord. Yeah, someone didn't read their notes on racial phylogeny. I'll let it slide though, because that wasn't part of the lore until Morrowind. His other half is Imperial, in case you were wondering. It's not as silly as a half Imperial vampire rock or anything, at least. Nothing but a vile spawn of evil. Kill me! Again? Hit me again! Tobias was originally here in Strauss Mackay on Merchant Biz, but after some asking around in the city, learns of the disappearance of Zara, who was not only in Strauss Mackay during the battle, but was also affiliated with the Crowns. Learning this prompts him to write a letter to her brother Cyrus, which is smuggled out of the Imperial Lockdown by Drikius, and later ends up in the paws of Serafra. For brevity's sake, I'm only going to mention the most important details of our meeting with Tobias. One of his roles is to introduce the player to this world, so he just has a lot of dialogue that discusses various relevant topics. Regarding the disappearance of Azara, Tobias gives Cyrus the name of the priest, Brother Niddle, who has more information about Azara. Cyrus asks if Tobias knows anything about the Restless League, remember them? The pirates whose pirating days were cut short? Tobias tells him it's a bad idea to speak of the League around town, as the Governor Richton is actively hunting down its members so he can send them to his little puzzle dungeon under the palace. This is the fate of anyone who is discovered to be a crown synthesizer. I mean, sympathizer. So it seems these pirates are in some way related to the crowns. Yes, a doubtful notion it is, pirates and politics, but there you have it. After a lengthy conversation about politics, the Empire, and past adventures, Cyrus says his goodbyes and heads across the street to the temple to follow up on his next lead. But of course, what would be a tavern without a good brawl? These are some of the finest of the forebears, and they have a few things that they would like to say. Excuse me. Hey, lucky there, goo. A crown come out of hiding. That's so, hey crown. Be good and bring us another round, eh? I hear you crowns think you're real brave dagger lads. Wanna test yourself against a real swordsman? I'm sick of chit chat, little crown boy. Pull that blade out if you know how, or leave me alone. Cyrus wipes the floor with these goofy R individuals, and they just crawl right back into their pints afterwards. Like nothing happened. You can even come back and fight them again, as it is considered practice by the game. Over at the temple, Cyrus can find a brother of R.K., an elderly man adorned in robes. 
Suspiciously orange, might I add. I won't spill the details of this conversation yet, since it'll be more relevant when we look at a later quest. Niddle can offer Cyrus more than just a dialogue window, though. In addition to providing information, Niddle can also perform healing magic on the player. Initially, this costs 25 gold, but later on, his services can become free once he considers us a friend. I was visiting Brother Niddle a lot during this playthrough, mostly because I wasn't bothering to loot every health potion from dungeons because it ran the risk of being attacked during the pickup animation. And yeah, there's an animation for every time you pick up an item and loot corpses. If you thought Red Dead Redemption was bad for this, oh, just you wait. Sometimes it's very particular about where you have to stand, which leads you to fidget around until you can manage to pick up the item you actually want to take. It's a bit of a pain in the arse, and at many points I just stop bothering to take loot altogether. Well, there you have it. Cyrus's first steps in Strasmachai. My initial impressions of Strasmachai and the world of Redguard were pretty good considering. This place has that old retro charm, and it's interesting seeing ideas that would later be developed in future titles. Though the game only takes place in and around this one town, and the map is very small. You can walk from one side of the island to the other in only about a minute or two. There aren't hardly enough unique NPCs to make exploring the town interesting, and half the buildings aren't accessible. Don't go out of your way to meet people. By the time the game is over, you will have most definitely talked to everyone. There's no side content either. Sometimes quests have multiple sources to gather information from, but that's generally what most of the townies in Stroh's Mackay serve as. Tourist information booths and rumour dispensers. At the top of town, across a stone bridge, is the Crown Palace of Stroh's Mackay. There are two entrances, the front door and the back door. The back door is off-limits, so the only way to get in is through the front. Don't forget about the back door. That will be very, very important when the time comes. Seriously, do not forget about the back door. The palace once belonged to Prince Ator, but now accommodates Governor Richton and his Imperial Garrison. Cyrus figures that if anyone's worth an interrogation at this point, it's the fat little Imperial Jelly Roll himself. Since his sister was a crown and, you know, the Empire is currently persecuting anyone who's on the wrong side of this conflict, Cyrus makes an attempt to persuade the palace guard, but he's just not having any of it and won't let anyone into the palace without a good reason. Luckily, Cyrus knows just the right man at the docks who might be able to dish him a ticket in. The man looking for a delivery boy, Kotaro. His job, if you remember, it was only less than 10 minutes ago, involved delivering an item to the palace. An amulet. Okay, here's the plan. Play courier for the guard to let us in simple. But that means we will actually have to run this errand, which involves first going to retrieve the amulet. Nagaster is the name of this fellow who is waiting for this delivery. Kataro simply refers to Nagaster as a harmless old hermit who's living up at the wizard's tower on the northwest of the island. Cyrus asks no further questions about the job, nor does he ask around town about this Nagasta fella. There are some rumours floating around about the guy. I'm sure he's just a harmless old hermit, just like Kataro said. Prior to setting out into the wilderness, Cyrus considers well? what items he may need to take for the journey. This is Garrick, the local High Elf goods merchant. You're gonna want to visit him and buy these three items. A compass, some carna feathers, and a shovel. A compass because at this stage you don't have a map and need to know which way you're going. You can't buy a map in town, not even from the cartographer. The feathers will allow you to use the fast travel system. Yes, this game has a fast travel system, sort of. You don't get to decide where you go on a map, like in Arena, Daggerfall, Oblivion, or Skyrim. You just look in the general direction where you want to go and use the feather at one of these shrines. I never used this system in my playthrough because I didn't know it existed. It's just some obscure system that I found by looking through the wiki. 
Finally, you want a shovel, which you won't actually use until over halfway through the game, but you might as well grab it now since Kotaro is paying Cyrus some coin up front. In a game such as this one, where there are no quest markers, there will be a lot of information that the player is expected to either remember or jot down. I was writing quest stages out in a notebook as well as various other thoughts I was having. It's not completely necessary though because Cyrus himself keeps a journal. Similar to the main character in Morrowind, Cyrus will jot down any important information he hears in his log. I didn't really use the log, both on account of the previously mentioned note taking, also because I found myself reading through guides on the wiki when I got stuck. Unfortunately, this is a game that needs to be played with a guide minimised in the background. There are portions throughout Redguard that range from unintuitive to just plain misleading, and if you're not keeping a guide handy then you will waste a lot of time running around trying to figure out what you're meant to do. I see no shame in using a guide to play games as old as this one, as there's nothing to gain from not following one. It just bypasses a lot of frustration in the long run. It's not like gamers in 1998 didn't have the internet, therefore any guides, so I don't see it as ruining the experience per se. The official companion even allegedly comes with a quick and dirty guide. I did at least attempt to solve a lot of the puzzles, without hints, but god damn, some of them are just obscure to say the least. On the other hand, there are also times when I didn't use a guide and ended up missing out on certain content or conversations. Not just quests, but basic features like fast travel and the fact you can block. Yes, I had no idea there was a block button for combat, and this is something I will bring up when I talk specifically about combat shortly. You'll also want to read up on various glitches in this game and how best to avoid them because they're gonna crop up a lot if you're not careful. God bless the UESP, you guys are really doing Todd's work out there. Poor Cyrus here neglected to read the UESP before heading out. As a result, he gets stuck inside the shoreline and has to reload his save game he made prior to hitting up the general store. Cyrus is mildly annoyed, but soon gets back on track. On the western rim of the island, our hero encounters his greatest challenge yet. Two rednecks who promptly remind him that he has no idea how the combat in this game is supposed to work. Hey bro, man, look at what we got here. We got some sea sucker! Ned and me need some dog sticky. Bet that sort of bring a pretty coin, huh? Bet that sort of bring a pretty coin, huh? Ned and me need some dog yeah, behind you. He's so read that thing sharp. The pirates have an accent problem. I have no idea what they were going for here. Is this a regional dialect? Can someone please tell me what part of Tamriel these guys are from? I would like to take this opportunity to analyse the combat of Redguard, since from now is where the real gameplay begins. Too slow! Too slow. You're trifling with him. Combat is a system, I guess, just not a very thought out or intuitive one. In fact, after spending almost 20 hours in this game, I could not figure out just what the deal with the combat was. Only by reading about this game on the UESP for this video did I even find out there was a dedicated block button. Up until this point, I had no idea what led to a successful dodge or parry. I still don't even know whether you can dodge or parry or whether that confusion can just be accredited to the jank. The combat system for me seemed like it was unpredictably switching between two sides of a bipolar episode. I could either slap enemies around without really trying or enemies would consistently land hits on me and I couldn't seem to get around the defences. Let's just throw all of that aside for a second and talk about how the combat is meant to work. You wanna go mate? I'll smash your fucking head in, I swear on me mum. Playing with your sword is easy. You have two actions, attack and block. You can do a jump attack, but I never got it to connect. There are three types of potions, healing, strength and iron skin, which restore HP, 
buff damage and reduce incoming damage respectively. The goal is to make your enemies fall over before they make you fall over, or before you fall off a ledge. There are no classes, there are no perks, there are no spells and there are no stat sheets. There are no attributes or birth signs. Cyrus has two skills, Athletics and Longblade, because all you will be doing in this game is jumping, running around and spamming the attack key. I would like to say that there's no hit chance either, but honestly I just cannot tell. At least in Morrowind, if I'm not hitting something, I can check my stats and see, oh I only have a 30 in agility and a 15 in my longblade skill, so that's why I'm getting f***ed up by the mud crabs outside Sedanine. Once again, this game does not have stats, so I would assume that every unblocked attack is supposed to be a hit, but it's just not that way for whatever reason. Your enemies can also attempt to wet man up in it. Human enemies can block. The few non-human enemies are just damage sponges. I think what you're meant to do here is keep your guard up until your enemy finishes their attack, then slip past their guard to land a hit. One thing I actually like about the combat is that if you're fighting multiple enemies, they will attempt to use tactics. Often one enemy will focus on engaging you head on while another goes round for the flank. They also call out to each other and take turns being the aggressor, meaning you don't just get absolutely swatted when dealing with crowds. This is something that I've only seen mods try to achieve in the later games. If you're one of those people who mod Skyrim into Dark Souls, then you know what I mean. Seriously though, why would you do that? Oh, I should also mention, the potions have this short drinking animation which leaves you vulnerable to attacks. You can try and use them during engagements, but honestly it's a gamble. You're better off trying to predict encounters and prepare your potion guzzling sessions ahead of time. I would say that the main issue plaguing Redguard's combat is a lack of feedback through animations. I hadn't figured out there was a block button because when you press view, which is mapped to the same key, Cyrus remains in the same stance. If there was some sort of dedicated block stance, it would be easier to intuit that holding that button is actually doing something. Or, you know, a f***ing tooltip. Same goes for enemies, give them a separate block stance and have the combat be about timing your attacks and blocks, maybe even add a time parry. I'm not suggesting we turn this game from 1998 into Dark Souls, but if you're gonna have an action system as opposed to one that relies on stats, then you may as well put some more effort into the presentation, at least enough to accurately convey what is happening. Tez 1, 2 and 3 can get away with having a lack of feedback because those games are trying to adapt the tabletop experience into a real-time dice roll combat system. It's more complex but still very comprehensible if you understand what's going on under the hood. Morrowind would implement enemy health bars on the heads up display which is honestly all the information you really need. Those games need to account for the stats of the player as well as the enemy and calculate a successful hit as well as how damaging that hit is. All attacks in Redguard have fixed values and only need to convey when an attack either lands or is blocked. In theory, it's simpler, but in practice, well, just look at it. Just, just look at it. Look at it! It's ugly, isn't it? You look at it! Hello. You look at it! Hi. Look at it! Look at it! Look at it! Look at it! All the basic systems are here for a serviceable swordplay system, it all falls apart due to jank and a lack of feedback. There is, however, an alternative to combat. Running past all the enemies, and if that's not possible, spamming the attack key and hoping for the best. I only bothered to fight enemies if they were on their own because groups were just not fun to face and yield little to no reward. To summarise, combat in Redguard is not fun. Not because it is hard, but because it is tedious, unpredictable, and not worth engaging with. Back to these fine gentlemen on the beach. 
After having killed them the first time, Cyrus goes to loot the bodies and the game crashes. The second time, he has a bit more luck and finds a map of the island in the jacket pocket of one of the swashbucklers. He takes a look at the map and, oh god, is that where Nagasta lives? An island? Ugh, n no one who isn't doing nefarious wizard shit ever lives on a secluded island. So it turns out there's a bit more to Nagasta than Katara was letting on, but we'll save that discussion for our initial meeting. To get to the Isle of Nagasta, Cyrus first has to cross the Spine. The Spine is a row of shoals with a bridge connecting them that crumbles to pieces as Cyrus proceeds. It's kind of cheesy, but I found this to be one of the only platforming sections in Radgard that I could loosely associate with the word fun. It's easy enough, and if you somehow manage to screw up a jump, then Cyrus will grab onto the remaining planks and pull himself up. There's actually meant to be a giant serpent here who would attack the player, but from what I can tell it was cut due to collision issues. It's at the end of the bridge where Cyrus starts to realise that things ain't quite so normal with this Nagasta fella. Atop the waves that batter the jagged shoals of Stroh's Mackay, there floats some sort of... creature? A vessel? Cyrus wasn't too sure of its origin, but thought, hey, this dude looks friendly enough. He's not one for talking, but if paid his fee, we'll take Cyrus to the island of Nagasta. The island is actually a graveyard, and a surprisingly animate one at that. As Cyrus makes his way further into the island, he's confronted by hordes of undead enemies, intent on gnawing his bones and feasting on his innards. The battle-hardened bone boxes go down quick enough, but the other fleshier inhabitants, the zombies, bounce right back up after taking a beating. It's here that Cyrus began developing his philosophy of just sprinting past all the enemies to reach the objective. What he doesn't know is that he's about to run into the greatest obstacle that the island has to offer. A big ol' metal gate. But don't worry, there's a crowbar nearby that Cyrus can use to force his way through. It is always funny to me that in a universe where magic not only exists, but is so common that even non-spellcasters can still make use of scrolls, that this is the only game to utilise a tool as simple as a crowbar to just pry open a door. Arena and Daggerfall let you bash locks open, but I don't think they have the specific tool for it. I guess the ancient art of brute forcing locks was lost after the dragon break. After getting gangbanged by some skelly bros, Cyrus finds a wheel which turns an eye which moves a statue, granting access to the front gate of Nicasta's luxury wizard apartment. A completely normal looking harmless old man, who totally isn't an evil necromancer, greets him by name. Cyrus, this one is Nagasta, the necromancer of Stros Magai. Have we met? The contractor informed this one of your impending arrival. He did? He gives Cyrus the amulet to deliver to Governor Richton, but Cyrus has some questions before he leaves, as might you at this point. Let's start off with what this big pink and scary looking thing is. Something that you cannot actually ask him about, but is probably one of the more interesting things about the guy. Nagasta is a necromancer, a servant to Manamarco, the King of Worms, and a follower of the Daedric Lord, Clavicus Vile. Oh, he's also a slowed. A race for which the UESP has a page of notable characters, and there is only one entry. I wonder who. Little is known about the Slowed. We know of their homeland, Fras, which lies somewhere off the west coast of Tamriel. We know that they're skilled in magic, particularly the dark arts of necromancy. We also know that they are likely hermaphrodites, but it's not clear how they reproduce. The slow do not experience any sort of emotion whatsoever. They act within their own interests and are even known to turn their young into soap, which can be used for rituals. I've also heard that slowed soap does wonders for the skin. They may have been responsible for a little trolling that happened. The trolling came in the form of a disease which wiped out half the population of Tamriel back in the first era. 
People got upset by this and decided to go over to Fras and do a little trolling of their own, this time in the form of a complete species-wide genocide. They didn't get all of them though, clearly. There's mention of other slowed around Tamriel, but we're yet to see any more intelligence slowed in the mainline games. Our wriggly little bundle of joy here is responsible for the Soul Snare, a magical net cast over Stroh's Makai which entraps all those who aren't laid to rest with a proper ritual. The souls captured in the snare are free pickings for Nagasta to get all necromantic with. Recently, this includes large numbers of corpses produced by the Civil War. His whole deal seems to be collecting as many souls as he can get his grubby little worm hands on, both for his experiments and to trade with the Daedric Lords like some sort of diabolical trading card game. Nagasta arrived on the island during the time of Fassad II, who was pretty chill to just let Nagasta do his thing since he wasn't bothering the living. When Fassad died and the Imperials took to Hammerfell, Nagasta became allied with Governor Richton. The amulet we're supposed to deliver is a gift intended to strengthen that relationship. It's clear though that Nagasta just doesn't want whoever's in charge to bother him, rather than forming any meaningful pact. Which is fair if you're an amphibious hermit getting up to necromantic shit on the down low, and just want your peace and quiet, and wish those darn kids would get off your damn graveyard and stop playing with the corpses. This is a little boring, you know, I'm, I find no fear in holding it, tossing around, you know, really and everything uses a baton, you know, it don't matter to me anymore. Cyrus takes a stroll back the way he came, sprinting past all the wandering souls of the island. He boards the ferry once more, now with the amulet that'll get him into the palace. He finds a nice cosy bone to rest on for his trip back into town. The amulet will have to stay in Cyrus's inventory for a little while longer, as there are some things that we must first take care of. The quest structure of Redguard is split into three branches. There's the main story of the game, of course, but also two other side stories that can be completed at any time. You do need to complete all the quests to trigger the finale, they are not optional. I'm doing these now because, for reasons, the guards around town all become hostile after the amulet quest. Important to note as well, Red Guard technically does not have quests, only event stages, or whatever you want to call them. The content of this game has been organised by the UESP to make it easier for a guide to cover each section. For the sake of this video, I'm just going to call them quests though, because that's what they are. I mentioned earlier that we had a conversation with the priest of Arche, Niddle, so here are those deets. He would like us to look into the disappearance of a fellow brother of Arche, Kifral. This does actually tie in with the ongoing search for Izara as the two were close. How close is only alluded to. But regardless of any curved swords, Kifral was sipping the Kool-Aid of Azara's crown propaganda for long enough that he himself became a sworn crown. This eventually led him to begin looking for the ring of Archmage Voa, which had fallen into the sea after he was slain by Nephalilagus during the battle. The power imbued in the ring is said to be capable of restoring Prince Ator's soul from his Soul Khan condo. Although he doesn't know it, the ring is what Cyrus is really after. The fate of Kifril is inconsequential. Mariah, the town gardener, mentions that Kifril would spend a lot of time in the park. Where's the park? Over by the waterfall. I'm ashamed you didn't know it. I have to spend more time on it. People really do enjoy it, especially that arcade boy, Kifril. 
Magnificent. I don't see anything other than palm trees and the usual shrubs over here, or anything that would really suggest this is a park and not just some random patch of grass and rubble. Observant players will notice a little hollowed out space behind the waterfall. Other players will just assume there has to be something behind the waterfall because it's a 90s game. And why would you go out of your way to make a waterfall unless you were going to put something behind it? Cyrus descends underground via rope. This is just one of the many times we'll be subjecting him to a dungeon crawl underneath the city. I shit you not, the city is home to almost every dungeon there is besides the Dwemer Ruins and the Necromancer Isle, the latter of which hardly counts. The Great Stone Chamber is home to a tribe of goblins, tentacle trap things, and is also flooded with green goo. Because, of course it is, that's just how goblins decorate the place. It's not acid, it's goblin juice, and it's highly addictive. Redguard does this little quirky thing when you reload a save game. I think it has something to do with DOSBox emulation, but I'm not too sure. When you load a save, everything happens much faster than usual for a few seconds. It's a blessing and a curse, as it does give you a good boost of speed, shaving a few seconds when trying to get back to where you were, but during platforming sections it meant I was often spawning in, forgetting to not move, then immediately falling off a ledge. I'd say it accounted for probably about 10-20% to of my total death count. Anyway, Cyrus drops off this bridge onto a bouncy mushroom, because we have green goo and goblins, so we have to have bouncy mushroom platforming sections. Those shroomers are actually alive, you know? They have emotions and desires just like the rest of us. Beware of the dark Shroomstein, however. He is not one to be trifled with. Crazy bozo having a lovely time minding their business. Deceiving foul thing. The sign pointing down here is not at all that helpful. It was kind of these goblins to leave signposts for Taurus, however. Very hospitable of them. There are a few nooks and crannies for Cyrus to explore in these caverns, but they don't offer much reward. Only a bit of gold and some potions. The former of which is less useful than you'd think, but potions are nice to have, I guess. And the traps I mentioned earlier are quite easy to spot because they stand out against the repeating ground texture. I still die to them quite a few times because it's hard to maintain focus when this is what you're dealing with. Eventually, Cyrus stumbles across Brother Kimball, who had a few too many sips of the goblin juice and succumbed to his fate. Judging by the route we took to get here, this guy must have been pretty athletic for a monk. He was kind enough to write in his journal as he lay dying, which strange enough is not uncommon for these games. Especially not uncommon for a certain club that I won't speak the first word of. In his final journal entry before total goblification, Kifrol mentions that he was supposed to meet with Azara down here and begin searching for the Archmage's ring. Azara stood the guy up though, poor dude. Kifrol thinks that the ring could be down here as the ocean's current might have swept Voa's body down into the caverns along with the ring, which by luck had actually been the case. The journal also gives Cyrus the secret goblin password to travel further into the goblin cave. Ooh. Ooh. which only gets worse from here. Out of all the dungeons I had to trek through, I found the Goblin Cave to be the most tedious. Not only does it include a fair amount of backtracking, but it also just throws enemies at the player. You can run past them, but you better not pop the poison mushrooms on your way through. Rushing through is also not the best idea, as it leads to gangs of goobers chasing the player, making stopping to do anything difficult. The stagnant colour palette also does the area no favours. Still, I've played worse. The dungeon experience in Redguard really is where everything falls to pieces. I imagine a common make or break factor to people trying out this game is whether or not they're willing to put up with the dungeons just for the sake of the more interesting narrative aspects, which is probably the reason you'd be watching a video like this one. 
Cyrus happens across a barrel just minding its own business out here by the Goo Lagoon, so he blows it up for fun. There's this shipwreck here, swallowed by the Goo. It's likely this is a ship from the Battle of Stroh's Mackay that took place a few months prior. Cyrus eventually tracks down the rest of that poor barrel's family and commits one final act of genocide against all barrel kind. This is partly what I was referring to when I brought up the confusing status of gunpowder earlier, unless you somehow argue that these gunpowder barrels are actually of Dwemer origin, and not just an oversight. That's the excuse all the Skyrim gun mods make to add law-friendly firearms, right? Fortunately, Cyrus's bloodlust also has the knock-on effect of causing a large stalactite in a nearby cavern to collapse, and create a new path to hop across. On the other side, there is a lever, which I found out was a lever and not just some random piece of scenery when I accidentally grabbed it. The lever opens a gate near the start of the level, so now Cyrus has to go all the way back through the cave to this thing which is apparently a teleporter, which you also wouldn't know unless you happen to be standing on it. This new area is home to some pretty dank trolls who cannot be killed, only stunned temporarily. There's also this horrible shroomer a bouncing puzzle, which isn't that bad when you know the exact place to jump from. You know the drill, Cyrus runs past all the enemies and finds himself hitching a ride on this little fella, the Goo Strider, lifeguard of the Goo Lagoon, who takes him to the final chamber. Mercy, at last. I must have spent a good hour and a half just in this one level at this point. There's some pretty cool architecture down here, which is never explained. I assumed it belongs to the goblins, but whatever. More importantly, we find the body of Archmage Voa, along with his signature ring. Cyrus snags it. Of course, it's not so straightforward. There is a boss battle, in thick and goopy quotation marks. This is the Uber Goober. The Uber Goober cannot be slain with a sword. At least, I don't think so. I, I did try. By sheer accident, I found out that you can just get him to strike the support pillar in the room once, which will crush him. Cyrus's pockets are already too laden with gold, and he cannot take all the coin from the Uber Goober's body. Yeah, you can only carry 500 gold at a time in this game, which is honestly more than you'll ever need, because you'll hardly be buying anything. Not that there is much to spend your money on, besides potions and a few quest items. A hop, a skip, a teleporter ride, and a short ascent. In a burst of daylight, Cyrus leaves this wretched hole to fester. Would sure suck for anyone stuck down here if this rope were to ever break. I'll tell you what did break, though. The game. See, from this point onward, for whatever reason, I could not open my menu when outside. All pressing escape would do is crash my game. So, naturally, this was a bit frustrating, but I thought I'd try my best to live with the fact that I could only save indoors from this point. Things only get worse from here, however, and you'll see how my game completely broke when we talk about the Dwemer Ruins. Yeah, this is the first Tez game to feature a Dwarven Dungeon Crawl trademark, and it happens to be one of the more visually interesting areas that Redguard has to offer. Cyrus returns to Brother Niddle, carrying the ring, and informs the priest that Kifral was sadly gobbled in the Goblin Cave. He reveals that the body of Prince Ator is in fact actually still in the temple, but they can't actually do anything to restore the prince's soul without a qualified mage. Brother Niddle is a Hogwarts dropout and can't help us in any way that doesn't involve providing healing services, which are now free as Niddle considers us a friend. You bet this came in handy since healing potions cost 25 gold each and restore a measly 15 health points per bottle. Cyrus can dabble in a little bit of alchemy, providing you have some aloe leaves and a glass bottle which you can find in the alchemist shack west of town. Another obscure addition that I only read about after my playthrough. You can mix the aloe with water from the well in town, then scoop that up into a bottle. You can also drink the plain water, but it only restores 5 HP. The mixture restores 15 HP, same as the health potions, but has 20 uses. A far cry from how alchemy works in the rest of the series, but I'm glad they didn't forget about it. This time, Cyrus decides to be a clever boy and consults the wisdom of the wiki before he leaves the ruins. 
He learns of a book that he needs to translate some Dwemer text in order to gain entry into the ruins, which I would be referring to as Vazark if ESO was canon. The ruins are left unnamed in this game. Why walk when you can ride? This is Jafur, the Khajiit bookseller hanging out in his shop in the plaza. Hail, Desert Walker. I am Cyrus. Jafur is at your service. Now, Redguard does have books like all the other games, you just can't actually read them. The best you get is a brief summary of what the book's about when inspecting them from the inventory screen or interacting with them from the shelf. But I mean, hey, this is an action game. If you want to go be a nerd and do nerd stuff, go play one of those nerd games, loser. You know, those games that Bethesda have been praised for until this point. The games that didn't almost kill the company despite including nerdy stuff like reading. The games that people actually wanted to play and not whatever this turned out to be. You are pissing me off. What next? These shelves hold wisdom and folly in equal measure. Choose carefully. Jafar himself has a pleasant voice, it's warm and sophisticated, which can be accredited to his desert origins. I wish we got some more diversity in the Khajiit voices in the later games, maybe to reflect the different regions of elsewhere. Then again, the same could be said for every other race. We've, we've already spent too long on this tangent, let's just buy the book on Dwarven Lore and move on already. On the opposite side of the Hunding Bay across from town, Cyrus happens upon this sci-fi looking our dome. He figures this must be the ruins, but he's wrong and ends up wasting a fair amount of time here because honestly he was just being kind of stupid. Turns out this is the observatory and although Dwemer in origin is actually still of use to the Empire, they are trying to get the place back in working order which is the responsibility of this old chap. He's, um, well, he's a bit quirky. I'm looking for a woman named Izari. Have you heard of her? I hear many things. I hear the pipe crumble, the gears turn, and the whistle of the pet bunny. The rat will never hear any women. Just try your best to forget about him for now. We'll be back here soon. The actual Dwemer ruins are just a short hike through the mountains and a breeze past the dozens of Imperial guards stationed out in the middle of nowhere. They can do nothing but shout as Cyrus makes his way past effortlessly, finding his way to the ancient door embedded within the face of the mountain, magically sealed to those who haven't taken a Duolingo course on Dwarvenese. Unfortunately, there are no crowbars up here, so Cyrus has to get his school book out. He does some impressive on-the-spot translation while the guards poke him with their pointy sticks. You're open! Die, Red Guard! You've all failed! You've lost Red Guard! You have him! Surrender now! The magically locked door creaks open, allowing entry into the ancient structure. The Dwemer disappeared after the Battle of Red Mountain, which was in First Era 700. The First Era, by the way, lasted almost 3,000 years. As of Redguard, it has been roughly 3,000 years since the Dwarves disappeared, and this is one of the earliest games. Some players don't realise how long it has been since the Dwarves vanished. There is a longer time gap between the Dwarves disappearing and the events of this game than there is between the founding of Rome and today. It's a miracle that there are even ruins left standing, let alone items worth pilfering from said ruins. This goes for every game in the series that features the dwarves and their long abandoned cities. I don't know, maybe it's a testament to how high tech these guys really were. Let's look inside, shall we? Immediately, you'll notice that the dwarven architecture is not too dissimilar from what we'd see later on in Vardenfell. There's some obvious palette differences, but of course Redguard would be the game to use more red in its colour palette. I mean, look at this guy's shirt. Yeah, I bet you guys thought you were real clever with that one. Still, this area wouldn't look out of place in Tez 3, which speaks to how much attention the Dwarven area got in comparison to the more stagnant dungeon crawls like the Goo Lagoon and the Catacombs. The Dwarves are mentioned in Arena and Daggerfall, but weren't fully fleshed out until Morrowind. Okay, there is a whole Dwarven level in Arena, but it has nothing to do with the Dwemer as we know them, so I don't think it counts. 
During production of Red Guard, they had already developed some of the details of concepts that would appear in the next mainline entry. Notably, the Dwarves, Empire, and the Beast Folk have the most fleshing out compared to their previous iterations. They are all pretty much the same between this game and Morrowind. This is also the first game where the Imperials are their own distinct race. Technically, multiple races if you pay mind to the pocket guide of the Empire that came with the game. I think this might actually be the game to introduce birth signs as a concept as well. Hell, in the intro cinematic, there are even some nods to future Elder Scrolls titles, Morrowind, Oblivion, and Romanelli. I can guess Romanelli was probably not Skyrim, judging by the name, but Tez V did feature a civil war involving the Empire, so maybe that was originally going to be the main focus. That's just my speculation, if I had to make sense of that. If this is meant to be taken at face value, then it's interesting that they already had Oblivion in design docs eight years in advance. I doubt it quite turned out the way that they anticipate, however. I can't imagine even back then anyone would be too thrilled about the implementation of face gen. Anyway, let's talk about something fun. You know what's fun in platformer games from the 90s with janky controls? Rope swinging sections. Yeah, I've had enough already. Thankfully, I can count on two hands how many ropes appear in this game. It's fortunate we have all this spare rope lying around, as the platforming areas here make me want to hang my- There are these pressure plate puzzles, which are made easier when the sound doesn't bug out, otherwise you have to kind of wing it. The goal is to stand on them for long enough so that the door opens, but if you stay too long, the statue lops your head off. Further through the dungeon, there are some familiar sights like these giant ballistae and some dwarven sphere mechs, which make their debut in these ruins. I think these are maybe one of the few enemies to maintain a consistent design all the way up to ESO. Some more platforming ensues until Cyrus encounters what may be the two most annoying puzzles in the Elder Scrolls Adventures Red Guard, consecutively. The first is this giant beetle looking thing. You have to flip it around and climb all over it to get it to pop out specific limbs so it can stand up and flick this switch on the ceiling, opening a door upstairs. You won't know that this is what the puzzle wants you to do though. I learned that from the wiki when I got tired of constantly falling, pushing and pulling parts to no avail. It's super annoying because you have to ride these lifts to get back up each time you want to try something new. If you're not following a guide, you'll just end up wasting more time than it's worth fumbling around on this Dwemer climbing frame. After having had enough jumping for one day, Cyrus returns to the previous chamber where a door leading outside is now open. These bridges are pretty cool and were also a staple of dwarven exteriors in Morrowind. I will remind you that I cannot save outdoors, so whatever happens out here, my last save will always be inside. That wouldn't be an issue for long however, as not far into this section you could say my game was ruined. I did manage to get halfway through this area after close to an hour of excruciating misery which almost made me consider giving up entirely. Before we talk about what I would consider to be the most bullshit puzzle in Redguard, we need to discuss that thing I've been alluding to. Break your fucking face tonight! Give me so during the hour in which I was frequently dying, reloading my game and loading areas, something finally snapped. The game just stopped letting me go outside entirely. This is one of the all too well known bugs of Redguard. Pages exist on the UESP and on Steam guides detailing how to fix this particular bug, but users on Steam also mention that it does not always work. And if it does not work for you, you are fucked. Basically, the fix is to copy the data of a previous version of the same area from when the game was working. Mine was just retroactively cursed and even in cases where I had saved outdoors, I could not open the menu without crashing. Nor could I go indoors and go back outside again without the same thing happening. While procuring research on how to Frankenstein my save file back to life, I stumbled across posts online discussing the Glide version available on GOG. Some said it was equally broken, while others said that it had been updated to run better since those last posts were made. 
While I don't know what's true and what isn't, I can tell you the differences between the two versions, my experiences between them, and then you can decide which version you want to play if you feel like subjecting yourself to this psychological experiment of a game. Okay, honestly, the difference is only graphical, at least it's meant to be. As someone who spent six hours playing the software version and more than a dozen hours on the glide version, I can say confidently that the glide version seems to be the more stable. I didn't encounter any game-breaking bugs using Glide despite playing for over twice as long as the software version, and also while going back to collect footage. Nor can I recall a time where the game crashed even once under Glide as opposed to the many issues I had on software. I was being more cautious not to do anything that would upset the engine, but from what I hear online this game has a habit of spontaneously breaking down like a used car. If you play this game, you may use the Glide version and have a horrible bug ridden time. Maybe I got lucky my second time, I just cannot tell you straight honestly. You'll just have to take my word that the GOG version is objectively the better way to experience Redguard. When comparing the graphics of the two versions is where you may find some reason to play one or the other. Starting with the resolution, software maxes out at 640x480, while Glide boasts an absolutely mind-blowing resolution of 1600x1200 pixels. Glide can run at full screen on modern devices, but it achieves this by stretching the display. In my recordings, it still looks as if it was running at 4 to 3 aspect ratio, while this is what you see on video, during gameplay, Glide will actually fill your monitor. Higher fidelity isn't automatically a good thing in these older games. I quite like the texture filtering effect going on in the software version. It gives off that classic retro vibe and helps to hide some of the details that just aren't there on the textures themselves, leaving more to the imagination if you have one of those. The only other noticeable differences in the Glide version are a clearer UI, some higher poly trees and a pink mist around the edge of the view distance. It does not increase the draw distance, but that's honestly for the best, as this whole map probably occupies the same area as the city of Vivek. We're watching you, scum. Oh, also, the software version takes place in an alternate universe where there is no sun, but somehow natural light manages to find its way onto Nern. Make of that what you will. The music slider does not seem to work on the software for whatever reason. You can move it, but in reality it's either maxed out or turned off. Works fine on Glide though, with functioning variable audio levels. This is important because you will be hearing the same tracks constantly, and although I appreciate some background jingle, I often prefer music to be in the background rather than dominating the audio space. The Glide version was advertised as running faster than the software rendered game due to epic, futuristic, hardware accelerated 3D graphics rendering technology. Honestly, both versions run about as well as a paraplegic caught in a glue trap. At least the game stays at double digit frame rates most of the time, but your mileage may vary with that. Can we get back to the shitty puzzles now, please? I hear you ask. Why yes, we can, dear viewer. Wouldn't you like to hear about some god-awful jumping puzzles? Okay, well this isn't much of a jumping puzzle as it is a walking puzzle, but it is by far the most unintuitively designed area in a game full of unintuitively designed things. Oh yeah, we're on the glide version from here on out. Try and keep up. At least now I can actually save whenever I want, which makes this area at least 50% more tolerable. So the puzzle here is that we're trying to get this machine to work so we can jump across things up here, activate something else, and then jump across things downstairs to get to where we need to be. You have to turn these valves in such a way to activate this machine, which I didn't even know was part of the puzzle and not just a piece of scenery. It doesn't even look like something that's possible to jump to, and even when I did know what I was doing, I died a lot just trying to get here. 
But yeah, turn these wheels in such a way and then activate the machine to get these things to spin. Then jump across here and turn these other wheels and then finally come down here and turn this one specific wheel again to send whatever we got working up here back downstairs. None of this is really suggested to the player as a solution. It's kind of hard to understand what I mean unless you are actively playing the game. It's one of those things that in actuality is quite simple but there is no effort made to explain explain it to the player. I did my best to solve this without using a guide, but I didn't have a clue why I was even here. How am I meant to solve a puzzle when you don't tell me what the puzzle is? You're just expected to either be one of the level designers or have a guide to fall back on. It only occurred to me just now that this is meant to be a volcano which I have no further comment on, so I don't know why I bring it up. The lava just kind of becomes lethal white noise past a certain point. I just think volcanoes are neat when outside the context of 90s puzzle platformers. Shout out to my viewers from... Eya Fjadja Lokuk. Eya Fjadja Lokuk. Eya Fjadja Lokuk. I can't, I can't do that. At the end, I can't do that. That place. Oh, and how could I forget Red Mountain? You guys don't get out much, but I love you all anyways. Finally, Cyrus finds himself in the ultimate chamber of this steam-powered test of patience. A giant concrete hall, home to a dwarven colossus. You may be thinking to yourself that there's some special way to kill him like there was with the Uber Goober, but you would be wrong. Cyrus simply just has to dance between his toes, evading damage and get off as many blows as it takes for the brass beast to topple over. I looked it up to see if there was an alternate solution or if I was doing it wrong, but no, this is actually how this is meant to be done. Upon whooping his shiny metal ass, a dwarven gear will fall out of the wreckage. I didn't mention it before, but this is the reason we've come here. It's the item that the old guy back at the observatory is after. Oh, and speaking of which... Here, here's the dwarven gear you need to fix the telescope. Ah, you found one! Good, good, but I'm not going to go back to the gear room, you're going to have to do it. Put the gear in on the far side! I'll give it a try. Erasmo is a dubious little creature with the voice of an angel. He has been assigned by Richton to fix this observatory for whatever reason. He's a bit addled in his old age, constantly going on about ghosts and flashes, which is part of his delusions and also part of a code for a future quest. Flash! That's what Erasmo said! Erasmo has managed to fix up most of the device, but is missing just one piece. I bet you can't guess what that is. Anyway, Cyrus takes the lift downstairs into this mess of a room and plugs the gear in. It's actually not as tricky as it looks, you just have to stand around and Cyrus will automatically grab the revolving platforms as they come hurtling towards him. Erasmo thanks him, naming Cyrus his hero. He's also free to use the telescope at his own leisure, which is a requirement for the next quest on this side chain. Fortunately, this next quest is only brief, but that may be accredited to my use of a guide. I wasn't planning on using a guide for all the puzzles in this game. The vast majority that are here feel like they just exist to waste your time. Who doesn't enjoy a good puzzle or investigation? Return of the Oberdeen and Disco Elysium have been two of my favourite investigatory experiences. Is that, is that a word? Investigatory? Those games are compelling enough, both narratively and in gameplay, to make the head scratchers feel worthwhile. But honestly here, I'm just not invested enough in this world to muster the willpower and figure these things out on my own. Even in the later games, puzzles are something that Bethesda never really improved at, but at least they went in the 
opposite direction of making them too simple. This game should have been the wake-up call for them to hire a guy who's good at writing puzzles. Battlespire also had puzzles and they also suck, especially the riddles that are mandatory to progress. Riddle me this. I am loud and obnoxious. I like music that rhymes. I'm a fraction of the population, but I commit half the crimes. Who am I? Hmm. Bosmo? The answer is... Khajiit. What was that? You will die like a rat. The next section will take us north of the city, out towards a camp of Yokudans. You can learn about them from the snake charmer in town after giving him a tip. Thank you, my boy. My name is Avi. How can I help you? The Yakudans face great prejudice in Hammerfell because of their religious practices. Even before the reign of Septim, they were not permitted to join either the Crowns or Forebears. Even the Yoho Pirates of the Restless League refused to take them on. A Yakudan lad called Hale was recently slain by a legionary and the rest of his group were forced out of town. Hale was not able to be given a proper burial, meaning his soul is caught in the snare and is free pickings for Nagaster to do necromantic shit with. Cyrus finds himself at the camp of displaced Yakudans, where he is initially told to sod off by coil. His mother, Saban, is in the midst of a ritual, suspending Hale's soul until it can be completed. What is your mother doing? Is she alright? The ritual involves setting these star stones in the appropriate position according to the birth sign of the individual. Problem. Conductor, we have a problem. Conductor, we have a problem. Conductor, we Hale was born under the sign of the serpent, which is a tragic sign to be born under. Its only boon is that stupid poison spell which also damages the player. It is also tragic because the serpent has attention deficit disorder and refuses to stay in one place, unlike the other star signs who have fixed positions in the night sky. This means that before the game lets him move the stones, Cyrus has to go to the observatory and use the telescope to discover the whereabouts of the serpent. I won't go into too much detail on how you're meant to work this puzzle out, because as mentioned before, I cheated a little. It's one of those aforementioned time-wasting puzzles which will just have the player going back and forth between locations, looking for scraps of information, which takes more time than it's worth. You could also just get lucky and accidentally find the solution. The telescope is simple enough to use, you just gotta wheel it over to the Lordstone, which is currently having its personal space invaded by the serpent. You just have to look through the scope and see either the head or body of the serpent, at which point the game will allow Cyrus to move the stones. I came here during the day, so I have no idea how I'm able to even see the stars, unless the telescope is enchanted with some sort of atmosphere piercing magic that allows Cyrus to see stars during daylight. It's anyone's guess, really. Back at the Yokudin camp, you just line this pattern here with the pattern on the ceiling in the observatory, and place the stones where the head and body would be. After dropping the stones, Hale's soul is free and the wise woman at the camp will now answer some questions. Why was Izara with Hale? Then don't go to Kahali? Don't go to Mongo, sir. Then hi. She needed mother's help. Her magic. But Mother was so mad about Hale that she sent your sister away. Mother does not know what magic your sister needed. I'm sorry, Cyrus. But we can assume that it has something to do with the Ring of Voa. She also has a few prophetic lines about events that will come to unfold, but generally doesn't have much else to relay at the moment. She tells us that when the time comes, we must visit her again. Cyrus says his farewells to Granny and makes for the palace to finally get this damn amulet out of his inventory. Oh, and by the way, all the events in this game take place over the course of like two days, if the scripted day-night cycles are anything to go by. They only trigger after certain story events. All of the stuff we've covered so far, Cyrus has basically managed to knock out in just a morning. 
The Pocket Guide to the Empire 1st Edition is something I would like to mention as a thing that in fact exists. I wasn't sure where I was going to put this quick tangent, so I'm placing it here just because this was my shortest section. I am great at organising these things, really. The Pocket Guide is a long and encompassing description of each region in Tamriel. It was included with physical copies of Red Guard inside the game manual. I miss when physical boxes had cool shit like this inside of them. I'm willing to bet that Tez 6 won't even come with a map unless you buy a collector's edition. Hang on, what's this? The guide shows just how much lore was cooking between the release of Daggerfall in 96 and this game two years later. Most of what is in this book wouldn't even appear in any game for many, many years. The 500 Companions of Ysgrimor, the Falmer, the Imperial City, the Morphology of the Khajiit, the Tribunal, the Great Houses of Morrowind, Greybeards, the Morag Tong. Banana. These are some of the more recognisable examples throughout the text, but there are plenty of other tidbits to read about. The lore of the Elder Scrolls is quite unique as far as commercially popular fantasy IPs are concerned, providing the perfect iceberg. Newer players can get settled in with the familiar Tolkien and historically inspired settings. As they go deeper into the world, they can start to uncover a whole lot more going on under the hood. The earliest writings of Tez Law really do a good job at blending a good amount of common tropes with subversions of those tropes to create a world that is comprehensive but still fresh and interesting. It's possible to go too far in either direction and end up with something totally generic or completely alien that will only interest the most hardcore of weird fantasy connoisseurs. Elder Scrolls is personally one of my favourite worlds to get lost in. I take a lot of inspiration from it when working on my own projects. I aim to keep this tangent fairly short in order to avoid going deep into lore discussions that probably aren't relevant, but if you enjoy this world and haven't read the pocket guides, you should. It's an interesting read if only for how radically different a lot of these concepts turned out in execution. These writings are easily the most interesting thing that Redguard has given to us. Unfortunately, the in-game dialogue does very very little to give a taste of this world to the player. Oblivion released with a third edition of the guide. I only skimmed through it, but it does just seem like an updated and more condensed version of the first edition because of how many retcons that game made. There is no second edition, but I'm sure we'll get a pocket guide to the Aldermary Dominion with the Elder Scrolls 6. And so, after that brief departure, we're finally here. The palace. Seat of Governor Richton and... Why are there always birds in the background whenever I record these? Shh. Shh. Oh. Window, window's getting closed. The palace. Seat of Governor Richton and hotbed for Imperial activity within the city. Initially, the doorman doesn't want to let Cyrus in, even carrying the amulet, but doesn't take much persuading to change his mind. I have an item he is expecting from the necromancer. Very well, hand it over. Sorry, but it comes with a message for Richton's ears only. I'm going to have to see him. That's not going to happen. Then he's never going to see this amulet again. All right, Richton. You win! I'll signal you win! What follows is another one of these in-game cutscenes where we, as an audience, are just here to watch the story unfold before our eyes, so we can have some context for the real action of the game. The awful platform sections and janky combat. Trifle. It also gives us an insight into Cyrus's few character traits. I haven't talked about Cyrus much, despite him being on screen almost all of the time. He is yet another blank slate character, unfortunately. Yeah, he has a backstory and motives and affiliations, but honestly he's just a vessel for the action, and the decisions he makes allow us to get to that action faster. 
Cyrus isn't one for diplomacy, at least not when it would slow down the pacing. More on Cyrus later, but honestly it's hard not to like the guy when he's voiced by Michael Mack. Sorry friend, I like ladies. Everything Richton tells him here is technically true. He suggests Azara was actually part of the Restless League, which is all but confirmed at this point. Still, he has no idea where she went. This whole scene is short-lived, however, when Cyrus straight up threatens the dude. You are dismissed, Kuria. We don't seem to understand each other, Governor. Azara is my sister, and this isn't an audience. It's an interrogation. Tell me all you know, or I'll give you more trouble than the League ever has. You would threaten an Imperial Governor? Are you simple? Threaten me, and you prove yourself a traitor, and must die for it. Guards, seize that man! A brief combat encounter follows, which I somehow managed to succeed at on my first try. I took only a few blows, despite being outnumbered 3 to 1 here. This is what I meant when I called the combat bipolar. Sometimes being outnumbered tends to make combat easier for whatever reason. Sometimes, not always, but here that was the case. It's not like I was really doing anything else except fidgeting and spamming attack for every encounter. Once the fighting is over, the Donima assassin, Dram, decides to step in. This is the guy whose arrow slew Prince Ator at the Battle of Strozmakai. He's actually based on Boba Fett, and he's canonically a femboy. Dram serves as Richton's right-hand man throughout this story. A strange position for an assassin, but it is what it is. He doesn't have a lot of presence in the story, and mainly just shows up to look cool. And to cast this lame-ass spell, which sends Cyrus to gay baby jail. Let's talk knives. Now say you're in the shower and Mitch over here tries to rape you, okay? What are you gonna do with this plastic knife, alright? Bendy, bendy, look at this. Stop having a boring knife, stop having a boring knife. What you gotta do is you gotta have one of these, okay? One flick, you're in business. Okay, check this out. One stab, question, <laughs> okay? Two stabs, <laughs> dead, okay? Add an egg, slice of ham, a pickle, three stabs, breakfast. Cyrus isn't the only man to be thrown into this hole, crawling with insects, vermin, and as your nose, what else? Over in the corner, a pirate lays dying on the floor, starving to death. My guess is that he's not vegan and doesn't want to eat the rats that crawl around in the tomb. Not vegan. He might not be a member of Peter, but he is a member of the Restless League, who, after some interrogation, was thrown down here to wither away and die. It's hilarious how impatient Cyrus is with this dying man. He barely manages to get his sentences out due to how hard it is for him to speak, but Cyrus is a busy man and won't wait for no one, not even a man down to his last dozen breaths. Rickton said Bizarre is in the League. Is it true? I must know. Damn informers. Yes, Izara's one of us. She's on Richton's list, all right. <clears throat> the pirate insists that if Cyrus ever gets out of this place, he should signal the League using the lighthouse in Saintsport. As his final breath lurches ever closer, the pirate pulls a key out from his prison suitcase and hands it to Cyrus. The key is for the lighthouse. He won't be needing it anymore, so trust Cyrus, some random guy who was just thrown down here, with all this info. There's one more thing that he has to tell, and it's the most important thing yet. Unfortunately, he dies before he can relay to Cyrus the official release date of The Elder Scrolls VI. Hey, you! Hey! Damn! Clearly, this guy never actually tried to get out of this prison because doing so is a cakewalk. At least the first part is. You just have to use the key to wiggle a stone loose from the wall, then use the extra like two and a half feet of height to reach a rope leading out of the tomb. Are you telling me that at no point did anyone consider that two prisoners could just boost each other out of the hole? Or at least consider reeling the rope back up to prevent escapes? No, the Empire would never think of something so simple. The player is parted from their belongings too, but only for about two minutes. Being tossed into jail is after all only a slight convenience to Cyrus, which is a shame because oftentimes the reason for being separated from your gear is to add some variety to the gameplay, such as a stealthy breakout or something along those lines. But there was no way that this game was even going to attempt to have a stealth mechanic, not if Bethesda could only barely manage to release the combat and platforming in a semi-functional state. 
The guards here can't bear the sight of an unarmed black man and wrongfully believe that they have the authority to kill a minority. It's not a big deal though, especially since I felt like an expert at evading combat in this game after just a couple of dungeon crawls. Well, to be fair, I did run through both of those and the Necromancer Isle twice by this point. Thank god the Imperials haven't discovered the crossbow yet, or maybe they just forgot how to make them. Again. Cyrus collects his equipment and saber from the bongo room, but still proceeds to run past all the enemies anyway just to style on them. To exfiltrate and evacuate this dank old tomb, Cyrus must unlock this door. It will only open when three stone slabs are placed into this thingy, and only if the correct symbol is selected when this lever is pressed. Could you guys not have like a normal prison? You know, one that's locked with a key. Is this supposed to be some kind of trial where if you can endure the traps and solve the puzzle door, then I guess you've proven your worth and deserve your freedom? Well, I think it's time. I really, really did not want to do this, but I'm going to have to. We need to talk about the platforming in Redguard. And much like the combat, how it doesn't work. This next section is brought to you by Captain Tobias's Dark Rum, because there is no way in all nine hells that I am going to talk about this game's combat while clear-headed. It's just that bad. <coughs> oh, did I say combat? I meant, I meant platforming. I, I, I already had a head start. <coughs> Grab a taste of the Captain's Stash today, now available at your nearest house of earthly delights. I can already tell that this is going to go just fine. It'd be best to start with something light. Let's touch base by talking about the control scheme. I haven't actually mentioned it up until this point, but Redgar does not have mouse look. You may have assumed from the footage that I am playing with a controller. I'm not. You control the camera using the left and right arrow keys, and walk Cyrus forward and back using their respective keys. Yep, but this game has tank controls. It takes some getting used to, but it makes sense when you consider that these types of games are typically designed to be played on consoles using a controller. One problem with that though, Redguard was not released on consoles, so it does not make much sense. It's not even like Mouse Look hadn't become standard for the series either. Daggerfall and Battlespire both have fully functional mouse controls. The controls in those games actually work fine, so I find the tank controls in Redguard to be unnecessary. I guess this was the standard for 3D platformers on the PC at the time, and they were just trying to emulate that experience. But come on, you could have at least given me the option to use a mouse. Dagger 4 had that choice in its menu, so I don't see why it would be impossible. Maybe they couldn't get mouse look to work in third person. Maybe it has something to do with how terribly this game runs. Maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. Oh god, what's this? My eyes feel as though they're boiling in my sockets. My, my nerves are seething as they pulse against my flesh. My brain is screaming at me to find the nearest 50 foot building and take a nose dive towards the sidewalk. Just end it all, please. These are not symptoms of any sort of breakdown, illness, or invasive alien mind control. These are symptoms of having to endure Redguard's platforming sections, and I'm starting to get sick just thinking about it. You would consider that in a game where half the puzzles are solved by jumping, that the mechanic would at least be consistent. I have found this to not be the case. Simple rooms with simple jumps are obviously the easiest to pull off. These areas don't involve a lot of camera movement and the gaps are parallel. It's when ledges get narrower, angular, and camera angles get more awkward where the platforming is at its complete worst. It often feels like you are fighting against the camera itself, trying to work out which direction Cyrus is going to end up leaping. Will he even make it? a foot off the ground. Is he gonna grab the ledge or just 
fall to his doom. Because the ledges are so picky, if Cyrus doesn't land on them at the right angle, then he won't catch them. The worst quirk of Redguard's platforming is this weak ass jump Cyrus will do if you're standing right on the edge of a ledge. Edge of a ledge. Edge of a ledge. Much of the finesse involved in Redguard's platforming is just timing your jumps right before the edge. I mean, it takes some practice, but really it's just annoying and I can't work out if it's meant to be intentional or just another bug. There's not really a situation I can think of where this move would be useful, so I'm going to go with the latter on that one. One tactic you will likely adopt, a practice even the wiki recommends, is to save after literally every jump. Every single jump. This is to reduce frustration from having to repeat sections when the game decides to punish Cyrus in such a manner. I am a big fan of this strategy, which is why many of my save names are just random gurgles of text. Thankfully, saving only takes a few seconds in game. There's also a quick save button too, but the game never told you this, so this is something else I didn't know until I had already finished the game. Fixing Redguard's platforming is simple on paper. Just make it fucking work. I imagine the engine this game runs on was a limiting factor in how well these systems all came together. Daggerfall, Battlespire and Redguard were all developed using Bethesda's in-house X engine. Morrowind was originally going to utilise the same engine but was spared that miserable fate with the decision to move over to Gamebryo. From my experience, OG Daggerfall and Battlespire don't operate anywhere near as terribly on the same engine. Engine feel is a weird concept. People tend to grow a fondness for things like the creation engine or the source engine because they inherit a kind of charm that just feels right. It's hard to explain, but I'm sure someone out there knows what I mean. The engine feel of Redguard can only be described as something that is fighting against itself. I honestly don't have much to say when things get technical. I'm not a technical guy. I don't know what kind of guy I am, really, other than a cynical t Let's just conclude by saying that the X engine was never intended to be used in this way and leave it at that. Oh, we're done. That's it. <sighs> I mentioned this door earlier, you have to work your way through three separate wings of the dungeon to gather three separate runes. The areas are all pretty straightforward, all linear actually. There's one time where a bridge receded and a door closed on me and I thought I was going to have to jump into the lava and load a save. Then the door just opened again and the bridge came out. That was kind of wacky. We are collecting these runes for this puzzle wheel thingy, which took me way too long to figure out than I care to admit. I forgot exactly what was going through my head here, but I was massively overcomplicating things. See, the platforming sections had already fried my brain. You turn the wheel to the triangle symbol and put all the rune stones in. Why? Because on this tapestry, the triangle has those same runes under it. Yeah, it's really that simple. In fact, it's just a little more involved than the dragon claw puzzles from Skyrim. Maybe it wasn't obvious, or maybe my brain is just that smooth. It's not like you can guess the answer without going to the other areas, because you need to put the runes in the wheel. This is probably why I thought the answer wouldn't just be that simple. Because as is, it's just the same premise of making sure you collected all three runes. But alas, there isn't much dungeon left to drag himself through before Cyrus can taste the salty air of freedom, though now he is a fugitive and the guards will attack him on sight, and pursue him around town. None of these services are affected, Cyrus is still free to use all those. There's a short cutscene that plays where Richton is informed of Cyrus's escape. I'm just gonna let the whole thing play out because I don't think I've treated you guys to an unedited cutscene yet. I have news of the Red Guard. Which bloody Red Guard? The one recently put into the catacombs. The one named Cyrus. He has escaped. What? He is nowhere to be found, sir. We are combing the streets for him now. But escape is impossible from the catacombs. The traps and so forth. Right, Dram? I hear you. Thank you, Guardsmen. Carry on, and keep me posted. Ah. 
I underestimated the Red Guard. Bah! Overestimated the dungeons of our enemies, most likely. Never trust another man's death traps. Double the guard immediately, and increase the patrols in town and along the waterfront. The Red Guard must not find his sister. Leave him to me. After escaping Juvie, I decided I was going to do a little exploring. This led to some of the following footage being out of sequence as I was accidentally ticking off quest stages. It turns out there isn't a lot to talk about with the locals that isn't somehow related to a quest. I mention this because the next couple of quests include a fair amount of talking. I'm only going to give a rundown on the most important parts of these quests to avoid waffling on too much. Believe it or not, there are things in this game that I won't even bring up in a 3 hour long video. Or at least that's how long my estimated runtime is after tallying up the script. I didn't think it would be near that long, but here we are. Already over an hour in and we haven't even finished the first act of this story. If you want the uncut experience, then I suggest you play the game yourself. Remember the last words of our deceased cellmate? Didn't he say to go to the lighthouse as soon as we get out of here? He did, but we don't want to do that. Not yet, at least. It would be a waste of time. Cyrus can call the Restless League ship into Saintsport, but they will not interact with him further without proof of deed. So let's first get us one of those. The first thing is to learn about a little hovel in town called the Smuggler's Den. The Smugglers are a group of people who work closely with the Restless League, in addition to just sitting around in their clubhouse gambling, I guess. The door to their clubhouse is locked. Only the those who know the password are allowed in. The second important topic can be gleaned from conversation with the silversmith in town. The handyman, Lakeen, lost his lady's lucky locket during one of his regular gambling sessions at the den. He knows the code word, but in order for Cyrus to extract that information, he must first do a favour for Lakeen. Cyrus hops over to the east side of town where Lakeen lurks about. I know you've been gambling at the smuggler's den, Lakeen, and I need to get in there. Damn! Where'd you hear that? Look, that's not something I'm proud of, so keep your voice down. Let's move this conversation elsewhere. After mentioning the locket, he pulls Cyrus aside to discuss things in private. Despite there not really being anyone around to eavesdrop, I'm pretty sure a meeting over here would look even more suspicious than just talking quietly but casually in the open. A passerby might get the wrong idea here, I'm just saying. Luckily, there aren't any NPCs to pass by. Of course, the favour Cyrus is running here is to get the guy's locket back and then he'll give Cyrus the code. I'll spare you the details of this entire errand. It's just a few tasks we need to complete so we can pinch the locket from Rolo's house. One part entails waving this flag around. Cyrus can even choose to keep it instead of returning it to the old man he borrowed it from, preventing him from doing his job and would likely cause chaos for ship looking to pull into harbour, if there were any ships to pull into harbour. Why does fathers ring a bell? To let everyone know there's ships here, of course! What do you think? I just shout out across the rooftops? When I see a ship, I go out on the walkway and wave my flag so favours knows to ring the bell! There's nothing quite as satisfying as that! Kinda makes you feel like a god, waving that flag and listening to the bell ring out over the whole town. A pity I can't let you try it, but we don't get too many ships in port these days. Cyrus returns the locket to Lakeen and in return is given the password for the hideout, which is Spoon. Mm, so thick. Smooth. Oh, the secret hideout is under the cartographer's shop. What's a password? Spoon. Cyrus ends up retrieving the insignia from the Nord who let him in. There's a few ways you can do this. 
Either by brawling, bribing, or befuddling the man. I managed to go down the persuasion path here. The insignia was given to the guy by Azara herself. She was after a pinch of malachite, and being in a rush and not having enough coin, she instead traded the League's good favour for the material instead. This Nord is another man who may or may not have had relations with Azara, much like the simp priest Niddle. At least now, after getting the insignia, it's worth making the trip to the lighthouse down in Saintsport, but we still need to know how to signal them. Flash, flash, flash. flash, flash, flash. Remember that? Because I had completely forgotten until this point my encounter with the dubious little scamp. <laughs> It turns out that line of gibberish he blurts out so often is actually code for how we need to signal the League. God forbid you somehow haven't met Erasmo at this point or you'd be actually clueless. It would have been handy to have another clue up here, a visual indication of the sequence of flashes, but no, you're just meant to have faith in the ramblings of a literal schizo. The signal is just two little flashes and a long flash. Note that the short flashes have to be really short. Are you telling me the League is actively being persecuted by the Empire, yet they have a ship stationed in view of this lighthouse and presumably the city just across the bay, only to act as a taxi service for potential allies? Silliness aside, Cyrus greets the Lady Pirate who rolls up and presents the insignia. Begrudgingly, she ferries him to their hideout so that he he can go speak to the big cheese. See, even she knows that taking people to the hideout in this way is a bad idea. She still does it though. Shortly, the two arrive at the shanty town of the Restless League. I don't know if this place has a proper name, everyone in the game just calls it their hideout. I don't know where this is meant to be located either. I would assume this is on some remote island somewhere as you can't visit the location without ship transport. It doesn't really matter either way. When you arrive here, you may be thinking to yourself, Oh boy, can't wait to explore this new town and meet all these cool pirates of which we've only heard rumours about until this point. Ha, <laughs> don't get your hopes up. Cyrus eventually locates who appears to be the leader of the troop, a dreadlock rasta who goes by the name of Basil. Where is she? Wrong strategy this early in the dialogue, sir. The game is to find out what the other one knows first, not show how much of the map you can't read. Can he die now? Step off, Shiny, we'll get to that in a minute. It's through him that we learn a bit more about the philosophy of the League, their current philosophy at least, after the Battle of Stroh's Mackay. With Atoll gone, the League has lost all courage to resist the Empire the old-fashioned way. What the League seek to do instead is fight the Empire in the shadows, presumably disrupting trade, raiding ships, and assassinating high-value targets. Basically the political equivalent of stealth archery. He figures that with enough prodding, the Empire will leave Hammer fell for more profitable endeavours. Basil, can I introduce you to someone real quick? This is the US government. Squandering tax dollars for your twisted amusement makes my pruny little heart sing like a tree frog, though I couldn't say why. They're kind of like the Empire, a little bit. Do you know how the US government handles acts of subterfuge, Basil? I mean, the Empire has an actual dragon, which is basically the Elder Scrolls equivalent of a drone strike. Yeah. yeah, you probably shouldn't poke the bear in this case, especially when your hideout is made of easily flammable materials. Basil has information about Azara, info that he's not willing to share just yet, since he has doubts that Cyrus is even her brother, as he claims. Since she never mentioned a brother, and why would she lie? She's only a pirate, after all. Pirates are the most honest folk I know. Remember Sir Shaky Fist from the cannonless ship all the way at the very beginning? He's here too and recognises Cyrus as the one who delivered a serving of Whoopass to his two strongest plebs. He has some pleasant things to say to Cyrus and decides that he too could go for some Whoopass right about now. Hear that, Vander? The man thinks to probe my innermost thoughts. Should I share with him a list of my heart's desires? Your list is too long, Basil. I'll tell mine. It's short and to the point. Your list will be short enough, fool, if you pull that sword on me. 
With his patience all thin and his chimneys all rustled, Baldy challenges Cyrus to a duel. A pirate duel. To his credit, the guy is a tough fight. Either that or the combat system woke up on the wrong side of the bed again. Hard to tell. Though, after a potion of iron skin and some sword spamming, Cyrus manages to best him. Cyrus returns to Basil, who hands him some bandages for his puppy wounds and the key to Azara's room. Here's a bandage. Tidy yourself up. Unless you were planning to use that sweet little puppy tongue to lick your wounds clean. You like breathing, Basil? Fine. Here's the key to Azar's lodge. We've already ransacked the clues to her whereabouts, but maybe you could find something we couldn't. Inside the room, Cyrus can find her journal, which is sealed by blood magic, a form of plot contrivance that wouldn't appear in the Elder Scrolls again until Skyrim. The blood is in the water, and you should be able to smell where this is going. Cyrus drains the blood from his bandages onto the journal, and ta-da! The journal and follow-up scene with Basil are ultimately not too telling. It is true that Azara had been with the League for some time. It's not outright stated whether she was the head of the group or commanding under Basil, or if they partake in some sort of joint leadership role. She was even responsible for getting a tour to ally with the League, if only in secret. They weren't allowed to join in the Battle of Stroh's Mackay though, for discretion's sake. For discretion's sake. A while after the crowns of Hammerfell fell, the League had come to possess the soul of a Tor, still trapped in the gem. Izara, who was not happy about the current direction of the League, took it upon herself to take the soul gem and figure out how to resurrect a Tor without help from the rest of the League. Of course, this is a theft and therefore a mutiny. And you know what we do to mutineers, right? <laughs> Cyrus, the gypsy woman told me you would come to Strauss Mackay. I laughed in her face, of course, but I leave this warning if only for respect of one's elders. If the blood lock is open, then I know it is you, and I ask you to heed the next. Leave me my dilemma, and go back to whatever road you love best these days. You've had ample practice. Izara's mission to restore the prince is what led to the trail of events Cyrus has been uncovering thus far. Her search for Voa's ring, her meeting with the gypsy grandma, and the acquisition of Malachite. There's just one last thread to follow, and that is her secret study sessions with some members of the Mages Guild. This is where we're headed next. Cyrus leaves the dishevelled shacks and pot-bellied pirates of the League behind as he once again embarks on the vessel that brought him here. With just one lead left to follow, it seems as if Cyrus is finally coming to the end of his sister's trail. Take me back to Stros Mackay. This is bigger than your sister, Red Guard! Remember that? This is about the kingdom! This is about Hammerfell now! Damn fool. Maybe just the damn fool we need to find Azara in the Soul Gym. Maybe so. The Mage's Guild is one of the saddest little areas in this game. It's almost breaching liminal space territory. I can't help but feel as though there should be people here. The Mage's Guild and other appearances are bustling hubs of sorcery and other magical shenanigans. They do, after all, provide arcane services to the public. How come the only person left here is the secretary who lives behind the desk? Did everyone just dip after Voa died? Speaking of which, isn't the Mages Guild an Imperial institution? Why was it here before their occupation? Hello. Hello, stranger. Welcome to the Mages Guild of Stros Mackay, fully chartered since 638 CE. I'm the resident shopkeeper hereabout. Feel free to look around, but remember, everything is guild property. If there's anything you'd like to buy, just let me know. Hmm. Those knockers are really something. Felicia is hesitant to talk about the Soul Gem. The new Archmage, Jagenvir, forbids any talk that could be seen as crown propaganda. He fears that they are already on thin ice and the Empire might come and condemn the Mage's clubhouse. 
but I thought that the Mage's Guild was an imperial institution. Why would they- I'm sure all four members of the guild would be very upset if that were to happen. Thankfully, Felicia's lips are on the looser end. Did I- did I really write that? That's- ugh. Anyway, she spills the tea on this whole soul fiasco. Azara disappeared shortly after stealing the soul gem from the restless slave. I think she may have come here with it. She did. I'll tell you about it. Izara and a guild member called Johto spent many days poring through books trying to figure out how to restore the prince's soul. Yes, they were indeed listening to Brett and Jiggs to relax and study to. Since Voa had been killed, there is no mage on the island powerful enough to do anything useful with the gem. Eventually though, the Empire learned of this foul scholarly treason and threw Johto into the city jail. Only Johto knows what happened to Azara, so Cyrus's next task is to go find him. But oh no, it's Archmage Jagenvir, and he's here to make sure that our sweet poppy tongue doesn't get the guild into any trouble. Silence! Archmage Jagenvir? I was only... Uh... Would you have the Empire put the whole of the guild in chain? Speaking of this, are strictly forbidden. Back off, Sparkly, I was just leaving. I have everything I wanted to know. You're not leaving until I'm sure you'll never speak a word of what you've learned. And I have a perfect and most satisfying means of ensuring your discretion. What do you think he does to accomplish this? That's right, he turns Cyrus into a goober. This little guy who can only speak in gibberish. Yellow! But that I can't understand a word. When you get out of the guild, you're free to just wander around and live your new life. You can talk to people around town with interesting results. Yellow! Fuck! Yes, yes, I know. Yellow! Battle to the righteous, thou awful ken. Yeah! Figment of the good drink, you are. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Chris, Sarah. You mean that Cyrus? Yellow! I can't understand any of that, Cyrus. Yellow! Ugh, you're disgusting. Hello? Don't be afraid. Ah, what? Well, no. ah, ah. Even the Imperial soldiers are pretty chill with this thing just running around between their toesies. You cannot go through doors or attack in any way, you can only hop around. Conveniently though, the form of the goober is just small enough to squeeze through one of the windows into the prison, where Johto is being detained. The furry has been sentenced to the pound for his anti-loyalist activities. He's actually the only person in the jail. I don't know why there is a prison here in addition to the one under the castle. I guess these are just the cells where they send drunks to sober up, and the dungeons under the palace are for political prisoners. In that case, why didn't they put him in the catacombs? Because this game can't have two trips to the same area. Oh wait, we go back there later. Well, you know what they say. Any two's great, but three is a crowd. Anyway, the Goofy Gooba dialogue options are actually another puzzle. It's not entirely obvious though, you have to get this little guy to sound out the words change me back. Change me back. What? Oh, Jota sees. Jagavir's favorite little trick. What did you do to annoy this Archmage Jota wonder? Well, Jojo take care of this, no problem. Change someone you wish Matal. There you are. Thank you. I'm Cyrus. Yeah, like I ever would have guessed that. If this has happened before, then why did I need to say that? Does the Archmage turn people into other things too, not just goobers? And surely if you have the power to turn goober into man, then you have the power to escape these bars, right? Do you really not know any unlocking spells, dude? Not even an intervention spell. It's not like he has any anti-arcane slave braces on. He just did magic. Why are you still here, man? The reason he's here is so he can tell us about relevant details to drive the plot forward. And that's the real magic. Plot magic, baby. 
Johto couldn't figure out how to restore the prince's soul in time and Azara was getting impatient. Granny wouldn't help her either because she was kinda busy dealing with her son's soul. The only other wizard on the island she hadn't tried talking to was none other than Nasty Nagasti himself, who Johto warned was bad business but Azara insisted she go pay him a visit. Obviously a bad move, Johto even told her about an elven artifact which can deflect any magic in case Nagasta tries anything necromantical. But Izara wants her prince's soul and she wants it now, otherwise she's going to call the manager down here and oh god, she's a Karen isn't she? Johto hands Cyrus a piece of the map that will lead him to the flask of Lilandril, said elven artifact capable of Uno reversing incoming magic. This thing is so powerful, legends say that a stable boy once defeated the High Wizard of Valenwood in combat using only the flask. It was lost sometime in the first era, somewhere near Stroh's Mackay due to a shipwreck. A map was drawn up of the flask's rough location, but eventually it got split into many different pieces. Don't ask me who drew the map or how they knew the flask location and didn't decide to just take the thing. Let's just assume they were hiding it, and then couldn't come back for whatever reason. After parting with his piece of the map, the kitty cat gets Epstein by the Dunma Twink assassin, Dram, because he knows too much. So instead of killing Cyrus, he kills the furry who clearly isn't going anywhere. Hey Cyrus, your plot armor showing. Fighting in narrow spaces like this is especially annoying due to the camera angle, but luckily he poofs away before this has a chance to go on for too long. He's also the only character in this game to wield his sword two-handed, which is a neat touch. Cyrus can't get back out the way he came because he's grown a bit since entering, so he has to escape the prison via the roof. During the escape, there's this awful platforming section around the Old Quarter, which goes on for far too long. The Old Quarter is a district of Stroh's Mackay, which was destroyed by Dragonfire during the battle. Honestly, this place doesn't look too badly damaged. Sure, there's some loose bits and a few holes in some of the buildings, but somehow these bouncy sheets manage to survive. This section is weirdly reminiscent of Minecraft parkour maps, in the sense that the architecture is literally only designed to be jumped across, which gives the whole place a disjointed feeling. Hey, here's the site of a literal massacre, have fun leaping between the rooftops while the guards try to poke you to death. Speaking of which, why are there so many Imperials up here? What, what were they doing? There's nothing of any strategic value here. Are they just hanging out? Also, it's nighttime now, you've probably noticed that. I did not have a hard time picking out a favourite quest in Redguard. It's obviously the one where we have to find pieces of a map and search for buried treasure. It's probably the only puzzle in the game that is tied to the plot, which is why it actually feels worthwhile and interesting, as opposed to the other puzzles which merely serve as roadblocks. And it's a perfect fit too, with the game finally leveraging its pirate shtick. The first part of the puzzle is investigatory, yeah I'm using that word again. We have to track down all the pieces of the map before we go digging. Cyrus actually already has two pieces of the map, the piece that Johto gave to him before he got Epsteined, and the insignia from earlier, which actually has part of the map scribbled on the back. Very convenient. What's also convenient is that all the other pieces of the map can be found inside of the city, because the method for obtaining all of them required talking to people. We're heading back to Jaffer's. Cyrus had recalled seeing some book about elven artifacts on one of the shelves and figured it might have some information about the flask. The book contains a map which Cyrus can't quite figure out himself, so he takes it to the cartographer in town to have him decipher it. He tells Cyrus to come back in a little while and he'll have the drawing of the map for him. That's literally it for the first part. One other piece can be found through Crendel. Name Cyrus. You okay? No, I'm Crandall. The Breton drunkard who can be found loitering outside the tavern. There's an ex-treasure hunter in town who mentions that he once possessed a piece of the map but unfortunately lost it. Turns out it wasn't lost but stolen by Crandall, who Cyrus can tail to find the location where he's keeping it hidden. I passed out one night on old Trithic's boat. What? While he was sleeping. Woke up early. L looking for a drink? And what do I find under his cot? 
<laughs> a piece of the map. <laughs> it probably doesn't even know it's gone. I lost the recording to this part, unfortunately. It was pretty funny following Crendel, myself being chased by guards, all the way to the park and glitching the guard AI by standing on the fence. You just gotta wait for Crandall to finish doing his thing and then snag his satchel to reveal the next part of the map. There is also a part of the map engraved on the bottom of a silver ship that can be found in the silversmith's house. You have to kill some guards who are raiding her warehouse, also trying to find the map, and she'll give you a key to her house so you can grab the ship. For whatever reason this bugged out and I had to use console commands to add the key to my inventory since the correct dialogue option did not appear. I think because I had killed the guards while I was exploring town before starting the Flask of Elandril quest. But I don't know, honestly, that's just a guess. Just gotta go back to Myko's to pick up the last piece of the map and holy shit, isn't this guy meant to draw maps for a living? What is this? The only helpful information here is the water line to the south, and since the treasure isn't likely to be in town, the only place this can be is the south coast near Saintsport. Honestly, the only major flaw with this map situation is that it's not obvious where to start from. It turns out you start from the Way Shrine, which you'd only be able to guess if you knew that the word Lecky was referring to the lady painted on the roof. Maybe it's obvious, maybe I missed something, but anyway, that's the only thing I had to look up. If you draw these pieces out on pen and paper, it's clear you'll have to start by heading east because that's the only direction where you won't end up swimming. So yeah, just plot your course and count your paces until ta-da, there be booty. I had more fun completing this quest than I had with any other in Redguard. Maps are more often than not a fun brain teaser because they involve exploring the environment, which sometimes has its own rewards. I wish the game involved more treasure hunting in general. Maybe this could be how you get weapon or stat upgrades or something. Just a little something extra to flash this game out, or you know. This is meant to be a pirate game, right? This is the only piratey thing Cyrus has done thus far. Sea of Thieves is a game that would make use of procedural generation to produce treasure maps and riddles which you can follow to dig up fat loot. I used to play that game an unhealthy amount and accumulated more map knowledge than I care to admit. It got to the point where I could just look at one of these X's and visualise the exact space in my head for every single island. Kind of an autistic skill to have, but that's just how much time I put into that game on the Xbox. I find the maps and riddles in that game fun, and I was hoping that the puzzles here in Redguard would be similar to those, since Sea of Thieves is also a pirate game with a heavy emphasis on problem solving. I think the world would feel so much bigger if the space was being utilised for treasure hunts in this way. The map already has several landmarks dotted around that are off-grid and that could be used for such content. It's strange that there aren't any besides this one quest. They're possibly one of the easiest, safest and least time-consuming puzzles to make. And players like me don't mind completing them because it's fun to test your map knowledge and be rewarded for doing so. It's why map puzzles also tend to creep into other genres as well. It's so intuitive. You look at a map, you see an X, the brain connects the dots. Interestingly, Skyrim would be the game to finally implement treasure maps as a true form of side content. I usually don't bother with them though because the loot is just generic crap you can find anywhere. But they are a nice change of pace for when you get tired of being verbally harassed by draugas and dragons. Skin tone, chicken bone, leave me alone, head up. Super knuckle, knuckle, belt buckle, banana, truffle, head up. I think that if they'd spent more time on puzzles like this, where you engage with the world, then I would have enjoyed Redguard more overall, since the world and its people are easily this game's greatest asset. Maybe tie in some of that additional lore as well. I don't know, maybe I'm in the minority, maybe everyone else has a seething hatred for maps. Maybe people really love awkward environmental puzzles and obscure codes. I mean, if you want a game that does environmental puzzles the right way, then go play Half-Life. Oh, hush hush now, this will make you feel all better. Shh. 
fucking idiot. But we're far from Black Mesa, and we should really stop talking about something as mundane as maps and puzzles. Especially with Azara waiting for us and an evil necromancer on the loose. Sorry, I mean totally harmless old hermit, right? I've got a cool new trinket to show the guy, and I think it's going to be a real shock to him. Attention, this video is being held under suspension by the Temple of the Dragonal. In the name of Omsi, this false doctrine shall no longer be broadcast throughout the manoirs of the Great House, but be not alarmed, switched, for you may redeem yourself. Have you not read the sermons of our Lord Vedic Kuma? Of course you haven't, Imperial Defile. If you read Sermon 17, then you would know of the Spike Waters, whose razor peaks tore over the woods of Struz McKay. Go switch, make the pilgrimage, and your spirit will be blessed once again in the judgment of your ancestors. One of the more amusing bugs in Redguard can be found way off the shores of Stroh's Mackay. All you have to do to reach it is just dodge the sharks that surround the island, which is easily done so long as you keep a good distance. One will only have to travel for a couple minutes or so until they happen across these strange monoliths. If you approach at the right angle, you can even walk straight up them. On the other side, you will notice that you can walk on the water from here on out. The camera also gets a bit janky and will get further away from Cyrus as he boldly goes where no man has gone before. I recommend using the shortcut Alt plus F11 here to speed up DOSBox if you plan on walking for a while. Eventually you will reach a landmass. Whichever way you go, the land will always be a replica of Stroh's Mackay but with none of the buildings or foliage. Only the ground textures will remain. Go further and you'll come across more of the same islands. The easiest way to get here is from the ferryman at the shoals, as there aren't any sharks out that way. I have been grabbed by a tentacle round here before though, so watch out for those. Then just keep heading east, don't worry about the Isle of Nagasta because it doesn't actually exist in the main world space. Keep going until you hit the back rooms. It is a wacky little bug, but it's interesting that the devs didn't really stop you from getting out here. Besides the sharks, which you can easily bamboozle, it's a fun trip to make if you feel like you need a rest between some of the game's quests. Uh, go now, go now, Swit. Make the pilgrimage to the spiked waters or your spirit will burn in the ire of your ancestors for eras to come. Okay, we're done. Can you get that spear out my face now? Thank you, please. Your regularly scheduled video essay will now resume. Blessings of the three upon you, Noir. Right, where were we? Uh, Alright, oh we just picked up the flask. If you want, you can beeline for Nagasta's tower, but I instead made a quick stop off in town for some supplies. It's not like you really need anything though, we're going back to the graveyard island so we can just run past all the enemies. It's the exact same route as the first time, except everything is already open. Nagasta is expecting us, and he buzzes Cyrus into his studio wizard's apartment. Come Cyrus, this one has what you see. Inside, Cyrus is immediately greeted by these two gangle farts. Okay, that's not what they're called, they're actually a type of Daedra called Vamai, which also appear in Battlespire. In this game, they are unique to this one room. They don't go down with the sword, but they are quite literally brain dead, and can be lured into the purple wizard goo in the centre of the room. Well, that was a short-lived appearance. The stairs are not an option, so the first challenge is getting to the top of Nasty's gaff. To do this, you have to pour a vial of goop into the big pool of purple goo to get it to explode and shoot you towards this ramp. Again, an awkward environmental puzzle that's not telegraphed particularly well. I fell off the ramp to the top of this tower more times than I care to admit due to the camera having a tough time at these angles. What we find up here makes it all worthwhile though, as Cyrus is finally reunited with his missing sister. Sister, but something is wrong. She's kind of, um, mm, mm. tweaked out. And then out in the darkness emerges that foul worm, Nagasta, and he's here to explain to Cyrus his sister's conundrum. She had in fact come to the necromancer with a tall soul and a bargain they struck. In exchange for her own soul, Nagasta would free the prince. 
eventually. Yeah, turns out Izara didn't think about laying down some basic deadlines when it came to dealing with the immortal, unfeeling necromancer, so he's putting off this errand indefinitely. And now her soul belongs to Clavicus Vile, and Nagasta keeps her body around as a trophy. I guess. I hope he's not doing anything necromantical in here. But what about the gem? Well, here's the kicker. Remember that amulet we delivered to Rickton? The one with the big gem embedded in the middle? In case you're not putting the dots together, Nagasta had the soul gem fashioned into the amulet as a gift for Rickton, so he may wear the disembodied soul of his slain enemy like a common piece of jewellery. Which is pretty metal, I've got to admit, but yeah, this is bad news and in the future we'll call for a repossession job. At the moment we have bigger, slimier problems to deal with. Now, now, let your sister serve as a walking, talking, cautionary tale, Cyrus. Would you repeat her mistakes by trifling with this one? And you propose to browbeat my lord, Vile, into relinquishing your sister's soul. Surely consider this. Vile is my business now. You have other things to worry about. <laughs> really? What might conceivably trouble this one? The question is, does your soul get caught in your own soul snare after you die, or does it just get to go straight to hell? Let me help you find out. This is where the Flask of Lalandriel comes in handy. Cyrus can absorb Nagasta's magic in the flask and yeet it right back at him, dealing damage. It is apparently possible to use the sword here to kill Nagasta, but not recommended. This encounter is a variation in combat, I guess, but it just kind of boils down to looking for where Nagasta teleports, and then just keeping your camera on him while Cyrus pulls out his Uno reverse card. It's just kind of goofy that this cunning and manipulative necromancer doesn't think to try anything other than basic destruction magic. Maybe Slodes don't feel pain either and that's why he doesn't realise that he's basically killing himself. I don't know, but it doesn't matter because he's just goo now. Which leaves us with Azara, whose soul we now have to restore. Cyrus is gonna have to go into the realm of Clavicus Vile and talk to the big man himself. Conveniently, there's a book right here which tells him how to perform a ritual to open a portal into the realm. It's written in the form of a riddle, of course. Ah, <sighs> these damn wizards and their insistence on riddles. Imagine if I wanted to bake a cake. I open a recipe book, expecting to see detailed instructions on how to make the cake. Instead, I'm given vague rhyming stanzas about what to do with my ingredients. Must be a dorky wizard thing, I guess. You have three vials containing different fluids, each of different colours, and you have to read the riddle to work out which of these ingredients should go into each vial. When all the vials are poured into the ritual circle, the portal will open. It's all just entirely based on reading this poem and matching the colours. The amber goes into the orc's blood, the unicorn horn goes into the hist sap, and the daedra heart goes into the ectoplasm. The problem with this riddle is that there are multiple ingredients that have similar, if not identical, colours. Come on, how is this an oversight? I have a feeling that they made all the models for the ingredients first before they decided on what the puzzle would actually be, then didn't bother to even change the colours or anything. Maybe it's because the room has this red ambience which makes it harder to work out the colours? I just don't know. I'd argue that Saint's hair here is clearly the more fitting option over the unicorn horn. The the stuff is literally white as snow, but alas. All three mixtures are well and truly mixed. Cyrus completes the ritual, opening the portal into the realm of Clavicus Vile. This is it. There's no going back. Cyrus is off to confront the Daedric Lord himself in his own plane of oblivion. Whatever happens in here will decide the fate of Cyrus, his lobotomized sister, the Restless League, and all of Hammerfell. He takes a deep breath and steps inside. Oh wow, I'm so glad you come! Yeah, that's really his actual voice. What do you think is the first thing that Cyrus says to the Daedric Prince? Oh come on, you know Cyrus by now. Hand over her soul, Clavicus, or I'll retire you from the Pantheon! I've gotta say, Cyrus may have the biggest pair of any protagonist in the Elder Scrolls series. Clavicus Vile is the Daedric god of bargaining and trickery, patron deity of Ancaps. 
I don't know what I imagined his realm would look like, certainly not like this, but it is kind of in his character to defy expectations. In response to Cyrus's threats, Clav tells him how much of a big silly goose he's being and sends him away to take a walk. Vile, I'm not here to chat. I'm here for my sister. And you're gonna give her to me, or I'm gonna tear you to pieces. You must be a bit thick! Take a little walk! and think things over. Come back when you're ready to talk sense. While Cyrus is on his little stroll around Oblivion's countryside, I want to talk to you about talking. Originally, this video was going to have a whole 10 minute section just dedicated to voice acting. It ended up being cut because I don't think that it meshed very well with the rest of the video. Instead, I'm just going to dedicate a few paragraphs here because I think now is a good time. Hey! The general consensus from people who try out this game is that the voice acting is bad. While there are traces of bad voice acting in Redguard, I do not think it's fair to say that the voice acting is bad overall. There are certainly slip ups and lines that could have done with a second take, but generally I don't think it's much worse than Oblivion's, especially in context. On average there's more to talk to NPCs about than in Oblivion, but that's expected when you only have a fraction of the characters. The two voice actors who really carry this game's cast are Jeff Baker and Jonathan Bryce. Both would return as voice actors in future Bethesda titles. Probably about two thirds of the NPCs are voiced by one of these two, which is impressive due to the range on display, even if some of those voices are quite silly. I don't even mind that though, because Redguard was going for a more tongue-in-cheek tone anyway. At least I think that was the intended direction. Overall, I would simply call Redguard's voice acting serviceable. There are a few standouts who I think really have the most personality invested into their voices. My favourites include Cyrus, Basil, the Snake Charmer, as well as all the furries. I still do prefer Morrowind's approach of having text windows because it allows the writers and quest designers to have more freedom. Also, it doesn't run into the issue of audio files taking up valuable disk space. But hey, they were trying to reach a new audience with this game and that audience can't read. At least the dialogue and red guard feels more like a stylistic choice than a complete downgrade. While we're on the topic, let's discuss the voice of Clavicus Vile. I'll be so boring, Cyrus! His role, as well as many others, are left uncredited, so I had to track down who actually voiced who for some of the characters. According to the fandom wiki, Clavicus Vile is voiced by none other than Todd Howard himself. I refuse to believe this. What? That really pisses me off. Listen to the actual Todd Howard's voice for Clavicus Vile and Oblivion. You will break our bargain? You dare trifle with me? Take care, Mortem. Clavicus Vile watches you now. Wait. And then listen to this. A follower of my brother, Hermaeus Mora, once said, The ultimate purpose of the Deidre Lords is to instruct and improve the generally deplorable character of mortal. I know both are highly edited, but I can't see this being Todd, not based on what few voice acting roles the guy has. The way he speaks is very recognisable, even when he's trying to act. Being said, I think I might have actually found the real voice of Todd hidden in this game. Well, well, what are we doing out so far from town? What? What? That hurt. Let I'm so sorry, but I need your coin, so you must- mm. You can use your tools, keep your tools, your prey in his pop. Just a few more, lad, and it'll all be over. Mm. Keep your tools sharp, my dad used to- It's hard to tell, but I am at least 80% sure that this is Todd Howard. Down on his luck after the Red Guard's flop and having to resort to piracy to make ends meet. I would like to say that Vile is voiced by Todd because it would be funny. Fandom cites their source for this as an interview Todd did where he states that he voiced Clavicus in a couple of games, but doesn't specifically mention Redguard. Maybe he did placeholder voice lines for the prince at some point? We'll probably never get to the bottom of that mystery. Who actually voices Vile here is unknown, but it was probably just either Baker or Bryce. Sorry if I spent too long on this, I know it's kind of pedantic. I just really wanted to dunk on fandom. UESP rules these streets, son. 
I actually kind of like Vile's depiction here because of how ridiculous it is. It works with the backdrop he's got going on here. Redguard tends to have more comedy and self-irony than any other game in the series. This is the last thing I expected to see after turning an evil worm wizard into sludge. Feel free to look around, Cyrus. No hurry. Take your time. After his walk, Cyrus is feeling refreshed and ready to go have another chat with Vile. That's a cute doggo you've got there, friend. Do you mind if I... Hmm. Interesting. I think he likes you, Cyrus. Vile is of course omnipotent and knows about how Cyrus murdered his sister's husband all those years ago. Yeah, I bet you never thought that plot point would come up again. I had certainly forgotten about that. Nothing ever really comes of it though. I think the purpose of this dialogue between Cyrus and Vile is meant to test Cyrus's character. This should be the moment where Cyrus has a big turnaround, has to come to terms with some deep character flaw and, you know, develop as a person. That thing protagonists are meant to to do in stories. Of course that doesn't happen and Cyrus's real test here is proving he's not a complete meathead. There is actually a moment here where Cyrus realises he can't just get what he wants through muscle and has to strike a bargain with the prince. For the last time, Vile, what do you want? In many ways, Vile is the perfect foil to Cyrus's machismo, at least in how we've seen Cyrus handle things through the story thus far. I don't really know what Cyrus's character is meant to be. He kind of drifts between the grizzled merc and the dashing rogue archetype on a whim, but never commits fully to either. Of course, there's the whole missing family member trope, which is the only thing the guy really cares about. Cyrus is a lot like Fallout 4's protagonist for reasons that I don't think are intentional. Both never really get to define their own character and are just vessels for the player to project themselves onto. They only really get as far as establishing a motivation which is tracking down a lost loved one. Lack of any sort of character arc aside, I still like Cyrus in the same way that a Marvel fanboy enjoys his favourite latex luchador. He has some epic quips and memorable dialogue which is aided by the fact that the guy is voiced by Michael Mack, and I would pay good money to have this man read me a bedtime story. This has been a most pleasant conversation but we must return to our research. Clavicus Vile would like to play a game. What kind? No, it's not a rock off challenge. The game comes in the form of a simple riddle. If Cyrus can answer correctly, then he gets to walk away with Azara's soul. If he loses, then Vile keeps both of their souls to do soul stuff with. He gonna make you his sex slave. You're gonna goggle mayonnaise. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, keep those butts in the seats. It's time for the most high stakes game show on this side of oblivion. It's time for Who Wants to Be a Lobotomite? Zara already lost, so Cyrus is here to bail her out. All he has to do to get the girl and save the world is solve one simple riddle. Take it, Vile. Two guardian. One always lies. One always tells the truth. You can ask one of them just one question. Just one. The game begins. Choose wisely! <laughs> Contestant, give us your answer. Sorry Cyrus, the network says we can't afford to let the contestants win the prize, so we trapped both of the doors. Darn! See Cyrus? If only you'd studied your lessons like the brothers told you. Ah oh, well, they can't all turn out to be winners! <laughs> The correct option is to go through the third door. The third door? Yes, the door to Vile's cottage. Okay, I'm kidding, the solution isn't actually that lame for once. What you have to do here is simply ask the right question, otherwise the game won't let you win. You have to ask either of the guardians which door the other would say is correct. Okay, let me attempt to explain this. Let's say that Dorman 1 is lying and Dorman 2 is telling the truth. Of course, there's no way to know, but it doesn't matter which way round it is, the logic is always going to work out the same. Dorman 1 
1 tells you that Dorman 2 would say the left door is correct. Since Dorman 1 is lying, then that would mean that the correct door is actually the one on the right. But even if Dorman 1 was telling the truth and Dorman 2 was lying, then he would still be correct in saying that the left door is trapped because that's the door Dorman 2 would say is correct, if he was lying about which one isn't trapped. Therefore, by asking this question, the correct door is the opposite of what either Dorman says. such a blockhead after all. But I don't think you've seen the last of me, Cyrus. I've got my eye on you. Until we meet again. Don't expect any ceremony, Azara's not even that thrilled to see Cyrus. She just wants to get back to her pirate friends so she can continue her schemes against the Empire. I'm sure they'll be perfectly welcoming after you just stole and essentially gave away the soul gem to the enemy. Or did Cyrus do that? Are couriers responsible for the deliveries they take on? Didn't they make a whole game about that? Damn courier. Your mounds are bigger than the bear and mightier than the bull. Cyrus follows his sister back to the hideout, of course, being the simp that he is. After all, the guy can't really form his own motivations, so is just rolling with this whole revolution thing if it'll help out his sister. I'm pretty sure just a few days ago, this guy couldn't care less about Hammerfell or its troubles, but now he's about to become the literal strong arm of a revolution against the Empire. Granted, he is now wanted by the Empire, and it's likely even if he went back to High Rock, he would be persecuted by Imperial authority. But that's never alluded to. No, he's gonna join up with the League now because his dommy mommy told him to. Or at least that's what I'm led to assume. They really could have done with giving Cyrus some journal entries or something as he discovers story beats. Anything to convey what this character is thinking in a way that doesn't seem unnatural. Because as is, the audience is just left to their own assumptions about what to make of the guy. I can't help but feel like there's some content that was cut from the Restless League. Content that would explain why Cyrus is now allying with them. They definitely should have had a greater presence throughout the game. Maybe they start off all mysterious-like, then over time Cyrus realises that they actually have the same goals and joins up with them. Maybe add some side content that involves doing some actual piracy. We already have that ship fight, kind of, in the first few minutes of the game. I can't imagine it'd be too hard just to put some Imperial enemies on a boat and a short cutscene where the League boards them. The League have this big hideout space, but it only has a handful of NPCs, most of which you can't talk to. None of the buildings are accessible apart from Azara's lodge. This could have been some sort of hub when Cyrus escapes the catacombs and is fleeing from the Empire, acting as a separate hub for services instead of having to play cat and mouse with the guards in town. I don't even think I'm asking for that much here, just a few NPCs and some short side content. Redguard barely ever leverages its whole pirate theme which would likely be the only thing that would draw in fans unfamiliar with the Elder Scrolls. And it's clear that this wasn't a game for fans of Bethesda's RPGs. At least I can't see Elder Scrolls fans at the time coming off of Arena and Daggerfall to be excited for a pirate fantasy adventure game. So who was the intended
intended audience for this game. And what even is the main theme? Is it fantasy? Is it a pirate game? Is it a story about one man against an empire? Is it a tropical island adventure? I don't think even Bethesda had one clear design goal for this game. It genuinely does feel like a mash of whatever influences they had at the time, which isn't a bad thing per se, but I think that lack of focus contributes to why not a lot of people were picking this game up in 98. All that being said, I was genuinely gripped on the story at this point in my playthrough. Unlike in Battlespire where I had to quite literally force myself to get through the game, here I actually wanted to keep playing just to see this thing through. It's not in any way the next great American novel, but it does rank in my top 3 for Bethesda's main quests. In fact, there's only three games of theirs where I can actually say that I enjoy the main quest, the other two being Morrowind and Daggerfall. Redguard's kind of cheating though because, well, it's nothing but main quest, but alas. In a meeting with the League, Cyrus spills the beans that he may have done a fucky wucky and placed the soul gem into the hands of the enemy, or did Azara do that? Let's say it was a family effort. No big deal though, cause Cyrus is the real Sigma here and offers to go alone into the palace treasury and retrieve the gem. There's just one little obstacle there. The dragon that burnt down the old quarter and practically decided the fate of the battle for the Imperials. But that's okay because we're just gonna kill him! I know I haven't talked a lot about this whole scene and that's because not a lot really happens. Cyrus and Azara have a heart to heart, if you can call it that, and then it's right back to it. Look, let's get this straight. You murdered my husband and ran away. On one day you robbed me of the two people I loved and trusted most in the world. Hakan was not much of a husband, but you were not, and you are not fit to judge him. Nor am I fit to judge you. You're guilty of God to know how many crimes and cruelties, not the least of all what you've done to your own flesh and blood. But whatever harm you've done to me, I forgive you. You're my blood and younger brother, and I can do no less. But if you trifle with the affairs of the League, and with the fate of Hammerfell and her people, then run away like you did last time, I will find you. You are a charming, vain, self-absorbed child, never thinking of anyone but yourself and your own profit. But if you take up this thing, you will see it through to the end, or I will kill you. I am going to find that soul gem, and I will get your prince back. Izara, I, I know what you think of me. I'm, I'm, I'm not proud of what I've been, but something, something is happening here, and I don't, really, I don't really know what I'm saying. Then don't say anything. I'm not interested in your words, Cyrus. It's enough to have you here. I just have to believe that you'll stay when I need you. I will finish this. We're now coming up on Act 3 and we only have two more quests to look at, so let's not waste any more time as we get right back into some more dungeon diving. Oh, jolly. Saddle up buckos, cause we're going back to the catacombs. Right back through the way we came out all those quests ago. There's a little door off to the side which leads to the treasure vaults, where the amulet and Nephalalagus await. We have the key to this door because Azara and Prince Ator used to be very close friends. Oh wait, you can't see the quotation mark gestures I'm making. These traps down here aren't Richtons, but actually at all's. This guy must have really sincerely loved traps. A man after my own heart, indeed. Traps Illustrated? Freddy! I, uh, I read it for the articles. There isn't really anything new that's worth mentioning in this entire dungeon. It's more of just the same old combat, platforming, and key card collecting to progress. There is this one part that has this weight puzzle. It's interesting on paper, but it becomes annoying to navigate when Cyrus refuses to pick up the right goddamn weight. You basically have to just drop these bricks in such a way that you can hold down these plates with the sun engravings, while also getting through without being puzzled to death. It's 
It's a simple premise, but it took me about 10 to 15 minutes to complete just because of how tedious this game's controls are. I would also be amiss if I were to neglect mentioning this horrible, horrible platforming area. The entire room spins and you have to work your way down without touching these spikes or dying of fall damage. Aside from being just really, really glitchy, it also sucks. All you have to do is just walk around in these rotating hallways until you find the correct tunnel that leads down to the bottom. You don't even really have to platform, which is probably a good thing if I'm being honest. It just looks way more complicated than it actually is. What's this? A little privacy. Nephalalagus is sat incubating the gem, so naturally he's gotta die. Of course a dragon fight in Redguard is about as epic as can be expected. I'm convinced that this is not actually a dragon, but a giant fire-breathing chicken, since all he really does is try to peck at Cyrus. Yep, this is as epic as it gets, truly. He doesn't even try to reposition. I even took the piss by tabbing out and leaving the game running, and when I tabbed back in I was still looking at this. Okay, so Cyrus can't actually kill Nephalalagus with his sword, he has to heat it up in the brazier and then he can deal damage to the dragon. Because why wouldn't an immortal fire-breathing child of Akatosh be immune to a hot stick? Sorry buddy, should have stayed in Akavir. Of course Nephalalagus doesn't really die. Cyrus isn't dragonborn so he can't absorb the dragon's soul, so I guess Nephalalagus is just playing dead here for some reason. Maybe we should poke him with a stick. This is the part where I would suggest some kind of way that this encounter can be improved. Maybe we don't actually fight Nephalalagus, we just steal the gem and platform our way out before he can kill us. At least then you'd have a logical boss fight for all the free mechanics in this game. Vile is the puzzle boss, the sequence at the end of the game is the combat finale, and Nephalalagus could have been the grand platforming climax. At least that way there'd be some cohesion between the mechanics and the plot instead of this fight literally being as dumb as it looks. I don't even want to think about this part of the game too hard because well, you can clearly see how it turned out. At least Nephalalagus can actually damage you while you heat up your sword, but you can poke him to death faster than he can peck you. With the beast dead, Cyrus can retrieve the soul gem from its pedestal, and pull out of that place faster than I pull out of your mother. We're then treated to another one of these cutscenes. The dragon is dead. And he's alive. We are not sure it was the Red God, my lord. Don't be stupid. That bastard sweats heroism. It could be no one else. He has the soul gem. Why do I pay you exactly, Dram? For my chilling countenance, of course. Leave him to me, you said, and with such confident assurance. I recall being set at ease about the matter. I recall thinking, well, now at last I can get down to the task of administering this troubled province. But this young man continues to cause us irreparable harm when we can least endure it. And now for the good news. Perhaps you remember the vicious group of rebels that's caused us so much trouble. The Restless League! Whose hideout would have remained a mystery if a prematurely dead Red Guard had never led me to it. It will take time to assemble an assault party, but I foresee no difficulties in cleaning out the whole League in one well-planned attack. I see. The Emperor warned me never to underestimate the subtlety of your schemes, Drab. Carry on, then. I await your full report.
Yeah, don't worry, because this isn't actually of any concern to the plot. It's just a little tease to make you think that the ending is more high stakes than it actually is, or that Cyrus's bold actions might actually have consequences. This whole revelation just seems to be a way to explain why Richton hasn't had Dram court-martialed for incompetence. All the dude has really done so far is kill a single furry who was already behind bars. He even graciously waited until Johto told Cyrus what he knew about the flask until he put an arrow in him. You had god knows how long to kill or interrogate this guy. It's not like he was going anywhere. He was even carrying part of the map to a relic that the Empire was searching for. If one of this guy's main duties since we escaped the catacombs is to stop us, then why hasn't he ambushed us at any point since then? Besides the prison, of course. He's really just been watching Cyrus as he skips around town like a dumbass. Surely if he was only tailing him to find the hideout, then he could have finished off Cyrus before he had the chance to free Azara. It's clear that they just wanted to put a cool looking assassin in this game to be a mysterious foe and not much else. And also because Rickton needed a wingman. Dram has as much to do with this game's plot as this entire tangent has to do with the next section of this video. Let's talk about music. The soundtrack for The Elder Scrolls Redguard was composed by Chip Ellinghorse and Grant Slauson. In total, they put together a whopping 16 minutes of music for this game. In comparison, Daggerfall had two and a half hours of OST and even Arena had 40 minutes. That's the reason why you're not hearing a lot of music from this game in the background of this video and I'm using music from other games to supplement, because they're just isn't a lot. I guess they just didn't have much disk space left due to the inclusion of fully voiced dialogue, which in itself is impressive for an open world game made in 98. It's just a shame that if that's the case, then sacrifices had to be made in the beats department. As for the music that is here, it's alright. I'd say it certainly captures the spirit of adventure that this game is all about. I'll play you some samples from a few of the tracks so you can get a feel for it. Keep in mind that the names of these tracks here were very difficult to track down and I'm still not 100% sure if I've matched the correct name to each track. The only place I could find the OST in full is on a single YouTube video released 7 years ago. I can't rip the audio straight from the game because the audio uses god knows what file format. Anyway, here's some dank pirate tunes. Thank you. 
What's interesting to know is that many of the action tracks include these long refrain sections, where you'd be forgiven in thinking that it's part of a separate track. I mean, the end title track is just one of the sections of Valor and Honor, but slightly edited. I don't know why it's not just a separate track entirely, but that's the way it is. I forget which track it is, but one of them has this ear-splitting noise right at the beginning, which always annoyed the hell out of me. If I can find a clip, I'll put it in. The soundtrack of Redguard is very different to Arena and Daggerfall soundtracks. Like those games, the soundtrack is all played through MIDI. I don't know much about the format when it comes to how it's used in DOS, but it's my understanding that those games use MIDI to save on file space. The rest of the audio, like sound effects and voiceover, would be stored audio files, which use a lot more space. I don't know then if this soundtrack is so short because of size limitations or they just figure that 16 minutes of music was long enough for a 14 plus hour game. On their official FAQ back in 98, Bethesda themselves expected the game to take 40 hours to complete, which may or may not be the case if you play this game without a guide. Surprisingly though, the soundtrack never managed to grate on me to the point where I had to turn it off, so I guess that speaks for its quality. Though not all the time does what you're hearing match what's happening on screen, especially during certain cutscenes. Speaking of cutscenes, I noticed music or variations on tracks that are only exclusive to certain pre-rendered cutscenes. I don't know if the audio for the isolated tracks are in the game files, probably not, but I couldn't find these tracks online as they don't trigger anywhere during gameplay. The tracks aren't divided into combat and explore tracks like they are in the later titles. I have a feeling that each area just operates on a playlist of select songs that it cycles through, if not just one song on repeat. The dungeons tend to have more intense battle tunes, naturally, whilst the residences play some of the chirpier licks. Overall, I just wish we got more music in this game, if only to breathe a bit more character into some of the areas that really needed it the most. Well, this is it. It's revolution time, baby. All the pieces are in place. The soul gem, the magic from Voa's ring, and the body of Prince Ator which Niddle is keeping hidden at the temple. Did I forget to mention that earlier? I can't remember. It would be pretty awkward if at this point the body was just unrecoverable. Don't bodies do that thing when they die? Um, decompose? Guess not if you're royalty. Or the temple of Arke and Stroh's Makai is hiding some strong embalming magic from the rest of Nern. According to some random website I found, only it takes four months for a corpse to decompose into only a skeleton, so I can't imagine at all would be looking too fresh after three. To get this whole soul shindig swing in, Cyrus has to go see his granny at the Okudin camp. She's the only person on the island who can perform the ritual to put a tall soul back into his body.
What is it? Did it work? I told no man, guys, Sora. I'm sorry, Cyrus. What happened? What did you do wrong? It didn't work. What now, Redguard? The sword. Oh, that any. His soul is in the sword. Mother? How did this happen? At Urno Mangai Sura. She doesn't know. It was... Who cares how it happened? It's over, Cyrus. We can't follow a sword. You failed us. We are through. Is this how you will honor your prince, then? Cautious, I've thought you, Basil, but never before a coward. We all have waited for the prince's return. Now that he has returned, you walk away. The form is different, true, but his spirit is here, here. And isn't his spirit the truest part of him? Did it occur that maybe he chose this shape and symbol as the sign of his intentions? Aye, perhaps that soul in hated delay snared helpless in a jewel while his men hid and shirked their duties, his duty. Perhaps that soul honed itself to this and by no mistake comes to you now in no more fine and final form as this, a sword. You say you cannot follow a sword? Well, I say that you have strayed from your own too long. Why are you here but to fight? Your prince has shown you the manner of his purest metal, eye and metal itself. And this true, unerring razor's message is clear beyond words, but now's not the time for words, but for brave hands, bright swords, and blood. Aye, boys, it's about blood now, too long frozen in your veins. And you'd rather yourself be rigid than follow me. Well, if you won't, then shamefully know that your prince will for his blood be solid too, but strained to steel and tempered in death. Arise alike as he, as swords as we are crowned alike as he. The prince is dead! Long live the prince! For as goofy as they can be at times, the cutscenes in Redguard can also go unbelievably hard. In fact, this may be one of the only Bethesda games not to flunk at its finale. I was bloody hyped for this. Cyrus really surprised me with his ungodly ability to pull a speech from out of his ass. Or maybe he was channeling some of the prints inside of him. Who knows? As much as I've criticised this game's lack of any overarching narrative in its characters, I have to say that this scene pieces everything this game has to offer perfectly. Allegedly, this whole fiasco is the third incarnation of the spirit Hoon Ding, not to be confused with Frandar Hunding, revered sword singer and redguard hero whose statue overlooks the harbour in town. Hoon Ding is a spirit that manifests to preserve the redguard people in times of great need. Essentially, Hoon Ding is the ghost of Yo Kudum plot armor, which is what Cyrus has already been sporting for this entire game, so it seems fitting. Here's the plan. The Restless League will secure the harbour while Cyrus makes his way to the palace, alone, to pop a cap in the governor's fat pear-shaped ass. He's not truly alone though, because with him he carries the soul of Prince Ator, which replaces the sabre Cyrus was using until this point. It's the only time you get a damage upgrade through the entire game as long as you don't make one fatal mistake. The Prince actually deals more base damage than Cyrus's sword does, even if he's using a potion. Because of how the potions are scripted, they don't actually apply extra damage to the soul sword. It actually deals less damage if you drink a strength potion. This is because the effect from strength potions is applied as a flat value instead of a multiplier. Brilliant. Of course this happens here, at the finale, the part of the game where people are more likely to use all the potions they've been stockpiling to this point. How they didn't pick up on this, I have no clue. Speaking of potions, I had no health going into this area, and the game doesn't give you a chance to prepare after talking to Granny, so I took the liberty of using console commands to give myself enough potions to get back to full health. Yes, this game has a console, no it's not very useful, but it can help you unfuck the game in certain scenarios. You guys didn't forget about the back door, did you?
The palace looks like it's going to be a big and confusing area, but it's really not. The goal is to get to the governor's airship before he can escape. Yes, there's a functional airship in a universe that somehow hasn't invented the cannon. There's no time limit though, of course, just hordes of Imperial soldiers between you and Richton. Here's a quick how-to for getting around the crib. Make your way through the guards' quarters and into the tunnels. When you emerge in the kitchen, put out this fire so you can get to this room, which should be familiar to you. Then jump up the pulpit and grab the key. Head back through the kitchen to this lift room. Use the key you just snatch to open this door, pull the lever to open the gate, and bam. Now let's go have a chat with the governor. Come, Redguard. Let me shave you to the bone. But I have had 200 years more practice. Ah, oh, hell, not you again. This fight would have been easier had I known that the strength potions were actually a hindrance here. Dram disappears anyway, so we can get to what is meant to be the true gameplay climax of Redguard. Fighting Rickton. And boy, did I climax. We can walk your fall! Oh. Do it to yourself! He's just like any other fight in this game, just with goofier animations. A bit disappointing, but I guess it's fitting that things end exactly how they began, with an awful, confusing sword fight. How remarkable. I may well be the first Imperial Admiral to surrender at this altitude. No surrender, Governor. You just die on your feet. The rules of engagement state quite clearly that a losing party may yield to his opponent on the field of battle, and that the victor may, within honorable reason, determine his ransom. Remind me in hell. But where's the money in that? Or Redguard honor? I know a swordsman like you, Redguard. Can't kill an unarmed man. And as a gentleman, I place myself under your protection, and as a swordsman of no little accomplishment, I congratulate you on your mastery of the longsword. And I congratulate you also on your small victory here. I have failed my Emperor, and may regret surviving to face his displeasure, oh. but... <laughs> Drop the weapon. What were those rules of engagement again? I'm sorry, Red God. The rules of engagement govern the affairs of gentlemen. But you, a rebel in arms, a traitor to the Emperor, and a threat to the Emperor's peace. All you have learned is summary execution. You die now, Redguard. Do it then, because that'll be the easy part. But look down there, Richton. Now there's an army that's tasted victory, and one you'll never defeat again. No more words. Richton, it's time you saw that Redguard fire you've heard so much about. You never did kill the Prince, Richton. He lives. I can't say this whole sequence lives up to the excitement of that cutscene in the temple, but I also don't think any Elder Scrolls quite captures its final moments very effectively, at least in terms of gameplay. You could say that it's kind of a Bethesda tradition at this point, but narratively this conclusion is satisfying enough with what we've been dealt. The Restless League is victorious. Azara takes the place as governess of Stroh's Mikai, or Queen of Hammerfell maybe, I'm not too sure. Yes, a doubtful notion it is, pirates and politics, but there you have it. The Emperor, Tiber Septim himself, will soon be arriving in Stroh's Mikai to work out a treaty along with other notables in Hammerfell's court. Hammerfell would still be incorporated into Septim's empire, however this time on more favourable terms for the Red Guards. The land wouldn't really become a point of contention again until later in the fourth era with the Aldermary Dominion's attempt to conquer the province. Back in the second era though, Septim still has a fair bit of work cut out for him. The Somerset Isles aren't going to conquer themselves, you know. Hey, do you guys hear that? It kind of sounds like...
But whatever happened to Cyrus, Azara, and the rest of the League? What happened to Stroh's Mackay and its people? For all we know, that history is long since forgotten, much like the tale of this bizarre spin-off. I delivered that amulet like you wanted. I think you owe me some money. Indeed I do! I am... Uh, amazed to see you! I've heard there was some misunderstanding with the governor. Perhaps you were, um, uh, wanted by the Imperials? I never put stock in rumors, however. Here's your 200 gold as promised. Now that we've been through all this grand adventure has to offer together, what are we left with? Sure, Redguard isn't anything like any of the other Scrolls games, you can't even place it within the same genre, but that's not because it tried something new and failed. Bethesda knew what they wanted this game to be from the very beginning of production, and well, they kind of delivered on that vision. Sure, Redguard is neck deep in technical issues and mechanics that just weren't quite there for one reason or another, but it at least succeeds in the goal of giving the player a rich story and will to invest themselves into, despite my complaints. Does this game hold up to the Grand Judge of Time? Not really. I think I've shown you enough to prove that. Should you try this game out? Maybe. I mean, it's certainly interesting. I can't say that I ever got bored, barring the few times getting stuck in a dungeon crawl. I think the question we should be asking is does this game have a right to exist? People get very uppity when it comes to arguments like whether such and such game can even be classed as an RPG. Okay, Redditors, clearly distinct from people. Does an Elder Scrolls even have to be an RPG? Is any experiment outside of the genre inherently doomed to fail? Well, that's not for any of us to decide. That decision is up to the company that owns the franchise, Bethesda. Actually, I guess it's Microsoft's IP now. What's stopping them from releasing an Elder Scrolls cooking sim? Or rebooting the adventure series as a modern AAA adventure title? Nothing. Bethesda has shown us time and time again that they're willing to invest heavily in their little experiments, even if it's something that no one asked for. Not once can I think of a time where one of these experiments have been remembered fondly by the community. Who knows, another Tez spin-off might come out in the future and it could be great, but that hasn't happened yet and I don't think it will. Redguard and Battlespire were never an indicator of the direction that the series would take moving forward. They were just smaller games to tide Tez fans over in the long gap between Daggerfall and Morrowind. But it is interesting to imagine a universe where more games like Redguard exist. The Elder Scrolls Adventures had more stories lined up than just Redguard, though they would still follow the misadventures of Cyrus the Restless. Eye of Argonia would have been set in the swampy jungles of the Black Marsh, whereas Paradise Sugar would take Cyrus to the Khajiit homeland of elsewhere. What's interesting about Paradise Sugar is that it would have involved playing as different members of Sarafra's family, each with a different Khajiit form. Although I can't say I'm the biggest fan of this action-adventure style of game, I have to admit the premise of using these shorter stories to explore the wider world of Tamriel is an awesome idea. Stories that really hone in on some of the details of the world and lore that full releases just can't justify doing. Of course, those games never saw any sort of real development. Shortly after Redguard release, Bethesda was basically put on life support, which led to the founding of Xenomax, and then it was all hands on deck with the production of Morrowind. Michael Kirkwright is kind of the mastermind behind this game's plot and the plot of the would-be sequels. However, he would leave Bethesda shortly after the release of Morrowind, though he has some additional credits for work on Oblivion and Skyrim. Kirkbride has also written many non-canon epics expanding on the Elder Scrolls lore and setting. Some of these include more adventures involving Cyrus, the Sword Meeting series, I guess you can call them, I hope that's not an innuendo. There's an unreleased audio story that Kirkbride has apparently been working on since 2013. It features voiceover from Michael Mack, but it's unclear whether the finished project will ever see the light of day. The last time Kirkbride talked about Tobias's sword meeting with Cyrus the Restless was in 2021. One of the other lead designers of Red Guard, Kirk Coleman, would continue to work at Bethesda in various design positions, all the way up to games as recent as The Elder Scrolls Blade in Fallout 76. This guy worked on Daggerfall, talk about a fall from grace. And then there's the big cheese. Todd is Todd, 
Todd will always be Todd. When civilization begins its rapid collapse and we're all evacuated into colonies under the surface of Mars, Todd will likely still be lying about features in the next Bethesda release. Although the man is finally starting to show his age, so I figure it's probably not long until he finally retires. Then I imagine we'll be left with Emil Pagliarulo running the show at Bethesda Softworks, a premise that I'm not particularly excited for, but it is what it is. But what about The Elder Scrolls Redguard? An ambitious but humble little game about puzzles and pirates, a story about one man against an empire fighting to restore his honour, a f***ing horrible platformer that somehow makes hitting a pre-rendered cutscene feel like one of the most rewarding accomplishments ever. Did Redguard fail because no one played it, or did no one play it because it failed? What can we learn from this whacked out experience? Nothing. Did you really expect to learn anything at the end of this video? No. This game sucks. Don't play it unless you're fucked in the head enough to think about making a multi-hour retrospective analysis. I would like to take a moment to mention an ongoing project to port Redguard into Unity. Since it's impossible to use code from the original 1998 game, the whole project is essentially remaking the entire game from the ground up. The goals of the project are to not only update the game visually, but provide modern controls, update the combat, and of course provide mod support. I don't think that this project will do for Redguard what DFU did for Daggerfall, but it would at least give those looking to experience Redguard a way to do so without having to put up with the god-awful engine this game runs on. The Redguard Unity project is still in the early stages of development, and as far as I can tell only has a small team behind it. I'm sure they'd appreciate it if you've sent some kind words their way, especially if you're really hoping to see this game be brought into a more playable state. It would be lovely if more people could experience the world of Redguard without having to put up with the awful clunky controls and game-breaking bugs. My only suggestion for the devs of Redguard Unity is to port the quest guide from the wiki into the game menu somewhere. I say that jokingly, but honestly it wouldn't be a bad feature. The base game does have a fan-made modding tool that allows you to edit scripts, subtitles, and textures. As far as I can tell, only two mods were ever made for this game, and they both come packaged with the program. Please let me know if you'd like to see me decimate Stroh's Mackay with a homebrew mod in a future video. That's it. I have nothing more to say about Redguard. Don't worry about the setup, by the way. Don't 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 worry about why you can see a cable on screen. It's it's just the way it has to be. Okay? It's just the way it has to be. At last I can finally free myself from having to think about this game. Granted, I did put myself into this situation after seeing that no one else had previously covered the game in depth. Now I can see why. Originally, I did not foresee this video being this long, but I never really gave myself a suggestion for runtime. Neither as a goal or as a hard limit. It's just something that never crossed my workflow. Maybe it should have. <laughs> Naturally, I'm thinking of doing a video about Battlespire as well as some lesser known Elder Scrolls games. If you know, you know. I can't see those being near as long as this one turned out. Other than that, I have a few videos planned focusing on modded content for various games. I don't know when any of those will be out. I might have to take a break from videos after the absolute state I am now in after finishing this one. As, um,. There's nothing written on this, by the way, it's just a bunch of it's just a bunch of doodles and, and crap. I'm currently not making any revenue from YouTube, so if you like what I'm doing here and want to support more videos like this one, then I need your money now. I'm kidding. But if you do want to toss a few quid my way, I have a page on Buy Me A Coffee where you can do such a thing. In the future, I want to do more edited segments that involve going to various sites with a camera to record certain footage. But to do that, I need proper filmmaking equipment, and that stuff isn't cheap. I promise you that any donations will not be going straight into buying drugs. At least not right away. Okay, we can tick off begging for money. What else is there? Oh yeah, I need to thank everyone whose memes and artwork I stole. There is a lot of stuff that I made myself too, but if you want to take credit for something, then feel free. 
I don't really take sourcing as seriously as I should, but everything that was helpful I'll link in the description. That's if I can remember where I found half this stuff. Don't don't mind the um the creaky floorboards by the way. Probably been hearing those all through the video. I know there's a few times where they've slipped on. Some good old creaks and squeaks. Thank you to the UESP for its amazing detailed guide that genuinely saved me countless hours when slogging through the worst parts of this game. Not to mention the additional info and links to other articles and, and fandom, I guess. You're, you're cool too. You don't you don't always get everything right, but um, you have you have cool things like like voice clips, I guess. The MP3 Please clips on fandom are pretty cool. I rate those. Thank you to everyone at Bethesda in 1996 who worked on this game. I know I just spent three hours essentially taking the piss out of it, but I'm sure it was no half-hearted effort. Unlike modern games that flop, Red Guard still actually has a soul, and it is worthy of your time, providing you have plenty to spare. Thank you to Obsidian, no, not the guys who made New Vegas. Obsidian is the software I've been writing this script on. It's truly an awesome piece of kit, and it's completely free. If you do any sort of writing, then I suggest you check it out. This isn't a show, by the way. I just spent like, I, sp I spent many days looking for good writing programs that were free, and this is the only one I could find, so Obsidian. If I had to stick to Notepad for writing this script, I would have literally lost my marbles. And thank you. Thank you. You. Thank you. I know it's cheesy to say that, but if you've put up with me for an entire video, then that alone is worthy of commendation. Not to mention the watch time analytics, which helped this video spread on YouTube, so thank you, sincerely. Like much of this script, I wrote this outro at 2am and have no idea how I should finish this video. It's not 2am anymore. In case you couldn't tell by the, uh, natural light seeping in. So here's the official trailer for Red Guard, just as Bethesda's fans would have seen it in 1998. Ta very much. Ta very much. Ta, ta very much. You, you, you've done good. You've done me proud. This is about Red Guard honor, boy. Stand aside. Creamy asylums. Where is she? The Red Guard must not find his sister. You would threaten an Imperial governor? This is about the kingdom! God sees that man. Come on. So you plan to take on the Empire? We could fight the Battle of Strohsburg High. Die now, Red Guard. It has to end now. Why?